Good evening, Mayor and Council. I'm happy to be with you tonight to uh, do a presentation of uh, a big piece of the Economic Development Strategy update. Uh, as, as you know, we're nearing the completion of this, this project. Uh, Mark Goodman from Community Attributes Incorporated is with us tonight. And um, we're going to focus on a, a main product of, of this strategy update. And uh, similar to the 2009 uh, Economic Development Strategy, which was the first of, of its kind for, for Kenmore, uh, we commissioned a, a profile report to give a sense of what, what are the demographics now as opposed to 2008, 2009, what are the market conditions, what are the prospects for, for additional um, business development in Kenmore. And um, that, uh, that is information that, that Mark is going to run through tonight. Uh, also, uh, he has had a chance to talk with a number of stakeholders, is at a Kenmore Business Alliance meeting, and, uh, and I think you'll find that his conversations were interesting as, as well. Um, and as you can imagine, times are different now than they were in 2008 uh, when, when we had uh, information prepared uh, by the consultants who worked on the original economic development strategy. And uh, if, if uh, any of you are interested in a hard copy of the 2009 strategies, you can kind of see what was, uh, what was uh, reported and, and recommended in, in that document. Uh, we can certainly provide that. I'll also have that uh, available in electronic format too for reference, but I think Mark will be able to kind of tonight go back and forth a bit about here's how things have, have changed in some of the economic conditions uh, in, in the uh, city and in the region. Uh, in a few weeks, uh, June 25th to be exact, we're going to be back at Council with the with the full strategy for your review, we're going to preview some of the some of the recommended goals and and high level strategies tonight. Uh, but uh, on the 25th, we'll be back focusing on what are the recommendations for things that that we could be working on over over the next uh, five to ten years. Uh, and as always, uh, these recommendations uh, are just that, uh, a guidepost, uh, if you will, to, uh, to inform us about what we might want to propose for uh, future budgets or future work programs. And of course, Council will uh, be in, in a situation of reviewing and, uh, and approving any specific actions that, that go forward in a, in a work program. Uh, Mark, uh, has been working with our entire leadership team uh, as as uh, th these recommendations have have been moving forward. Uh, I like to say that when it comes to economic development, every single person in our organization has a role to play in inspiring investment and and uh, getting the message out that this is a good place to be, a good place to in invest. Um, and um, I will also note that just like, uh, w well, we have done this from time to time uh, for uh, other purposes, but we asked community attributes to also update our commercial development capacity uh, analysis because, as you know, there's been work that's been done in the regional business zone and, and other downtown areas. Uh, over the last few years, so we wanted to have that and uh, updated. And also, they are doing some material for us, uh, highlighting where are the development capacity opportunities, so that we can use that in marketing and, and in conversations with with uh, potential investors. I will mention also that the Port of Seattle uh, helped to fund that piece of of this project. So. Um, with that, I'm going to turn it over to Mark. We have a lot of, of uh, slides to get through, but uh, please 
uh, let us know if you have any questions along the way, and then ideally we'll, we'll have 10 or 15 minutes toward, toward the end of the hour to focus on discussion as well. So thank you. Thank you, Nancy. Um, well, uh, and thank you for the opportunity to be here in, in the study session format. This is a, a really good opportunity to tell you about what we've learned and, and paint a little bit more of a picture about how we've landed where we have in terms of the goals and strategies we've developed so far leading up to our next meeting. Um, I'm going to work through these slides fairly quickly, just in the interest of time. Uh, don't hesitate to ask questions, interrupt me. Um, I'm happy to have discussion while I'm talking. Um, but I'll jump right in. Um, just a little bit of a, a overview of what we're talking about today, give a little background. I'll walk through our profile update, um, the selected exhibits we have here before you. Um, we'll talk about uh, real estate conditions and the commercial lands analysis that Nancy spoke to. Um, and then we'll give a preview of the goals and strategies we've developed, what I'll call working draft goals and strategies um, that hopefully we can land on and talk a bit about. Um, a little bit on the background of the project. Um, this is an update to your existing plan like Nancy spoke to. Um, that is very much a part of our plan. Your, the, the 2009 uh, strategy you have, we've uh, taken that into, into consideration as part of this process. Everything from what we chose to analyze as part of our uh, profile update to uh, how we've landed at the goals, any of the strategies and specific actions we're um, considering. Um, and we want to look at this as a plan for the next five to ten years, a similar time frame that you've been um, using this uh, original plan. Um, our core tasks are market profile, commercial lands, uh, stakeholder and community engagement, so both uh, business owners and the broader community, um, and then to develop goal strategies and implementation plan as part of this. Um, these are the current goals you have. I wanted to get these in front of you um, just to remind you of, of where we're coming from, and this will come into play a little bit later in our presentation um, and how we're building on these. Um, we're not completely reinventing the wheel in terms of your goals. Um, these are all still very much relevant. Um, and I know these are th you're all very familiar with these, um, but I just wanted to make sure to remind you of these. And these questions that we were asking ourselves, um, what has been accomplished since 2009? City staff has been really helpful in understanding that, especially Nancy. Um, are these goals still appropriate? Um, what has changed since then? Um, diving right into the profile, these are the guiding questions we established. Um, to help uh, guide our development of analytics and, and where did we want to visit, uh, what, what data sources did we want to visit, what analytics did we want to take a look at. Um, we also adopted in the, in the gray box uh, a comparison city framework, very similar to what you saw in your original 2000 update or 2009 update, um, where we want to look at your peer network, uh, the cities nearby, um, broader market comparisons, and then uh, regional comparisons to the counties uh, of both Snohomish and King. Um, and so then I'll walk through these um, and hopefully try to answer your questions. Um, so what are the key demographic trends impacting the city? Um, obviously growth, population growth is, um, is a big topic regionally. Uh, since 2010, the city's average, uh, added approximately uh, 2,000 residents, a little bit more than that, um, and that's still growing. Um, these numbers don't necessarily reflect some of the more recent development that's opened or that will be uh, coming online soon. Um, in terms of growth, uh, in terms of a, a regional comparison, uh, the city's growth rate over that time frame isn't anything um, out, of, out of the normal in terms of uh, comparisons to the region, um, but you are growing at a faster rate than some of your neighbors like Lake Forest Park and Woodinville. Um, uh, in terms of uh, projected growth, so this is really a reflection of what uh, the planning framework, uh, the PSRC, um, uh, regional planning body, um, is projecting for Kenmore right now. Um, and what really stood out to us is that employment growth is projected to be greater than household growth. So um, regional planning is saying that employment growth is going to be stronger here. Um, this is a place where, where, where jobs will be funneled. Um, and uh, it's actually higher than many of the comparison cities that we looked at. Puget Sound Regional Council, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, they, it, they use an, uh, a modeling platform. It's called Urban Sim, and it's, uh, it's an allocation model. So they'll take uh, projected growth, growth forecasts at a regional level, 
and allocate those out um, at a sub-regional and then smaller, smaller geography um, to cities. And so it's based on the city's capacity. Um, so zoning definitely comes into play. Um, what, what Nancy was talking about earlier is the city's relative uh, capacity for growth, so zoning and capacity, and other factors that are folded into that modeling. Um, you know, I, I don't want to say that these numbers are something that everyone should be betting on. They're, it's a planning framework. It's how uh, our Comprehensive Plan and Growth Management Act in the state of Washington works um, for uh, urban environments like this. Um, for us, it provides a little perspective about what regional growth is saying about the city um, and it provides a little context for, for you as policymakers and decision makers to understand um, how the city is, is projected to grow. Um, the one thing I know about a forecast is that it's wrong. They, they don't have the number right perfectly. Um, but it does give you a sense of what, what, what people are thinking for the city. Yep. Oh, and, and I've asked Lori Anderson to, to be here tonight. So you're, you're welcome to come up to, to the table, Lori, uh, in case any questions come up. Because she and Debbie have been the, the main consumers of the commercial uh, development capacity update. So feel free. That would be a, that would be a significant part of your capacity. Um, I'd have to dive a little deeper to understand how they interpreted some of your uh, redevelopable areas and, and assumptions for your zoning. Um, but if, if you have anything to add on that, I might just add that uh, PSRC contacted us and they sent us the maps and had us verify the assumptions that we were making about the zoning. So they did contact us to get our feedback about um, about the model. Uh, they have actually a couple of different models that they use, but this is the one that I think they were looking more in terms of market forces uh, to address. The, um, the other thing that I uh, could add is that the, um, the forecasts are, you know, they're looking at a sort of what, are, what is our zoning saying, but then also what are our surrounding neighbor zoning saying, and then they assign it out regionally to all the different communities. So I have a question on this graph. So is the top line the households? The, the yeah, bl the blue went from 7,301 up to the 12,323? Yes. Yep. So how many people per household are you assuming? And the reason I'm struggling with it is if I kind of estimate where 2018 is, and so you say, well, about 9,000 households and we got 22,000 people, then they would only be predicting we'd be gaining 3,000 households, which would be 6,000 people by 2040. And that's nowhere near the projections I've heard PRC was saying that Kenmore would grow. So I'm puzzled by this one. Yeah, I don't think I can answer that specific question. We can certainly look into it. Um, again, I was thinking that the household number was about 1.8 is the number that they were using, but that doesn't uh, fit very well with your comment. So uh, Mark and I haven't talked about the numbers, so we'll have to pursue that a little bit. All right, thank you. Mm -hmm. yep. Thank you, and I, yeah, I'm happy to, to verify that. One, to make sure we've got it right on this graph, but two, um, to get a little better understanding of of what their view is on population growth and this household growth, and make sure it makes all sense. Uh, all makes sense. Um, so, um, in terms of uh, speaking of households and growth, uh, we, we take a look at um, uh, household composition, and what we're trying to understand is um, a good indicator for us that we like to look at is your composition related to families and, and household size. So this is one such uh, way of looking at that. Um, you have a relatively high share of families. Um, including uh, families with children. Um, and stacking up comparatively to the rest of the region, it's, it's fairly similar to a lot of the neighboring cities that we're talking about. Um, it is a higher share than what you'd find across the region in terms of uh, King County and Snohomish County. Um, looking that at from a little slightly different angle uh, or perspective is um, the size of houses. Um, and what you do have is a relatively higher share of four or more people per household. So households with four or more people. Um, and uh, that's likely an indicator of the f number of families and types of housing you have, um, which is um, something we'll look at in another exhibit. 
Um, we also looked at educational attainment, and this is something that really did strike me, and I don't, I don't know if it comes through quite well enough in this exhibit, but um, the relative growth you've seen in um, people with uh, college degrees or higher, uh, especially in professional degrees, graduate professional degrees, um, has been pretty striking, I think. Um, and um, this will be interesting to see how this comes to bear in, in years moving forward. Um, but it's a pretty big difference um, in terms of the number of people with those kinds of degrees back in 2010. And a bit of an indicator of the type of people, um, levels of education of people that are moving here um, to the city in the last uh, uh, six years or so. Um, and in terms of your relative concentration of people with um, higher education, college degrees, or graduate and professional degrees, um, you have a similar concentration to those found in some of your neighboring cities. This is a highly educated region, um, but uh, well above what you would find regionally in Snohomish County um, and a little bit above what you'd find in King County. Um, so that, that did strike us as something that's evolving in the city. Um, age distribution, I think the thing that really uh, stood out to us was uh, you're not necessarily an older city. Your, your median household uh, or median age is similar to what you'd find regionally, um, but you have seen a, 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 an increase in the population of, uh, of people that are 55 and older. Um, and um, that mix of people that are at or near retirement um, uh, as a growth uh, in your demographics. Um, your median household incomes is another a place we like to take a look at. It's a good good comparison framework um, when looking at the region. Um, you have relatively high incomes here um, and uh, well above regional averages in King and Snohomish County um, and towards the higher end of the comparison city framework we looked at. Um, uh, and $93,000 is a very high uh, for a statewide especially. Um, so high incomes in the city, which probably doesn't surprise many people, but um, uh, you know, higher than Bothell, similar to what you'd find in Lake Forest Park in Kirkland. Um, another thing or another uh, data point we like to look at is your housing stock just to um, kind of verify the types of ownership and types of units you have. Um, as a city, you're predominantly single family, um, which probably doesn't surprise anyone here, um, predominantly owner occupied and single family. Um, that's obviously changing and this data doesn't reflect some of the new development that's occurred um, over the last couple of years. So that number will be changing as you um, see more of this type of development or the, the, the development we're nearby right now come into, come into the data. Um, so your housing mix is evolving, although it's still likely to remain that, that predominant single family use. Um, and looking at uh, your comparison city framework, only Lake Forest Park is a higher concentration of single family homes as a city. Uh, so where this all comes together, I, I like to look at um, jobs to housing ratio as a good barometer of a city and their relative role in a region. Um, it's, a, it's a comparison we like to use in a lot of our work. It's a really simplistic way of understanding um, a city and its employment and its housing. Um, so this is simply the number of jobs compared to the city's number of housing units. Um, at point four, uh, the city is largely a bedroom community. Um, so people are living here and largely commuting outside to work. Um, and it's nice to compare to the regional framework. Uh, I was surprised by Woodenville. I did double check that. Um, <laughs> and uh, I, I, I knew that it was a bit of a job center, but that ratio is, is really up there. Um, Bothell is more balanced um, in terms of employment. Um, then obviously Lake Forest Park is very much a bedroom community with a little bit of everything in between. Um, and so that's a, that's a good barometer to understand and, and how that might change over the next 10 years as a city. Um, and how would you want it to change, potentially? Um, some cities would love to see that go up. Some cities like it just where it is um, in terms of the balance they have. Um, uh, in terms of uh, where people work and what they do for a living, um, we like to look at the journey to work uh, data. And this was something that was looked at uh, in your 2009 plan. And um, what I think is interesting, and Nancy pointed this out, is that it hasn't changed. Uh, these numbers really haven't changed since 2009. Uh, people that uh, live here predominantly are commuting outside of the city. There are very few people that live and work in the city, um, and that really hasn't changed over the last eight years. And, and Mark, I, I think that's interesting because we have a lot of home-based businesses, and so I don't know how that is captured in, in these And, and so numbers. sole proprietors or home-based businesses wouldn't be captured in this data, um, and, and how that trend has occurred over time, that, that wouldn't be represented here. Mm -hmm. um, 
Yeah, so this is, uh, it's U.S. Census, it's LEHD, it's, it's their on the map program. Yep, yep, yep. So it's not Oh, it is, and it's, uh, it just keeps getting better. They keep adding features to the, the data and what's available. And, you know, we try to, the level of precision that we're illustrating here is probably a little bit, I would want to say there's a, a margin of error in all of this data. Um, uh, I think it's a good indicator overall of, you know, the general commuting patterns. Um, but I would say that uh, you don't want to be overly precise with this data either. Um, I think it's safe to say that, you know, Kenmore, compared to a lot of other cities, has a, has a slightly higher percentage or, or fewer people that are able to live and work in the city than some of the regional comparisons we looked at. It's not an uncommon uh, relationship, though. Even in cities that are major employment centers, most people don't live and work in the same community, even in places that have a really high number of uh, jobs. It's, um, it's actually amazing how few cities have uh, a majority of people that live and work in the same place. It's, it's usually in more rural areas that you'll see that. Um, but that is a number that is interesting and, and it is low. Uh, it is relatively low in Kenmore. Um, see, these are some of the locations. Uh, uh, you'll see that um, according to LEHD data, about a third of people are commuting into Seattle for jobs. And then it's distributed across with Bellevue and Redmond being uh, fairly significant destinations for uh, jobs. Um, and that illustrates the relative ease of access uh, from Kenmore, which is something that came up uh, during our stakeholder interviews. Um, it's obviously an easy enough place to get to, uh, uh, or get to Seattle from here, um, but also Eastside communities as well, uh, which is something that's brought up to us a lot. Um, this is a map, uh, this is using uh, 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 s uh, business data uh, source called Hoover's. Um, we clean up the data as best we can. We know there are errors in it and there's not always perfectly accurate, especially with dynamics of businesses always changing and um, over time. What I wanted to point out was um, two things. One, the relative concentration of retail and hospitality along uh, SR-522. Um, and then if you look at the ring colors, uh, there's a lot of green. Um, and there's, so there's a lot of businesses that, according to our data, are founded since 2007. Um, and that was really interesting to us. Um, and then you'll see a lot of the data, it's, it's showing that there are also businesses out in your residential neighborhoods. Um, some of those are real, some of them aren't. Um, but that's a relatively high number uh, that are dispersed across your residentially zoned areas. So those can be sole proprietorships, um, some of the home-based businesses that we've been talking about. Um, uh, in terms of employment, uh, covered employment, uh, the city's experienced a net decrease uh, in covered employment uh, since the last study. Um, and in terms of a, uh, an overall um, changes in employment, you've seen a relative increase in, in retail uh, as well as education. Um, and obviously that would come in, in hand with best year university. Um, and yeah. And just a quick question, what do you mean by covered? Uh, covered, it's, uh, it's, it's the data that's collected by uh, the state and then distributed through the Puget Sound Regional Council. And it's implied by this, uh, it's, it's basically data based on the state's unemployment uh, insurance program. Okay, thank um, you. It represents typically about 90% of all jobs. Um, and it's, the, it's, it's a good source of data. It's, the, it's what regional planning uses. Yep. Deborah, you have a question? Oh. I do. Um, so since 2010 would be when the rest of the economy was going well and we're, we're showing a decrease in employment, I just want to make sure I understand this. So during a rising economy. You, according to the data here, uh, your loss of employment was really between 2008 and 2010, um, which is pretty similar to what other communities lost, or at least timing-wise. Okay, um, so it was bef before 2010? Okay, I was looking at the first bullet, it said that since 2010, experienced a net decrease in employment. Oh, that should say 2000, Kimber, uh, it should say 2008, I'm sorry. Yeah, That's sorry. better, thank you. <laughs> yep, yep, thank you. <laughs> Good catch. Um, and what you do point out is that since 2010, the city's employment has remained relatively flat. We've added um, a few jobs, but there hasn't been any major increase in employment in the city. Um, and I'll make sure to fix that commentary. Well, and what, what else is interesting, it shows that we have not recovered yeah. from where we were in 2008. Yep, exactly. Um, there's lots of reasons for that. Um, don't mean this to be a, a terribly pessimistic uh, exhibit, um, and you are starting to see uh, a relative climb, uh, a trend upwards, um, really since 2012. Uh, it just hasn't been that significant uh, jump. 
Um, and these numbers are relatively small, so all it would take is, is really one, one significant employer to really change the dynamic of, of this graph. So um, these, are, these are relatively small employment numbers. And what does WTU stand for? Yeah, so that's um, Warehousing, Transportation, and Utilities. Okay. Um, so it's, it's, it's industrial, light industrial typically. Keep this moving. Um, this is just the general distribution of jobs across the comparison city framework we were talking about. Um, obviously Kirkland's a major employment center uh, regionally, Bothell is as well. Um, so very different relationships uh, across this corridor and throughout the region in terms of what, what are job centers, um, what, are, what are driving our regional economy, and what Kenmore's role is. Um, Kenmore's more in the vein of a Lake Forest Park in terms of the amount of employment. Um, with that said, there's some really unique uh, small businesses here um, that we've interviewed and spoken with, so there's a strong infrastructure of business and a strong his history here. Uh, unlike some of the other, uh, uh, what I would call bedroom communities we, we, we've worked in, so you have some really strong institutional legacy businesses especially. Um, uh, this is a little breakdown on what people do for a living that actually live in Kenmore. I won't spend too much time on this. I, you know, there, there isn't anything particularly striking about this data except that a majority of the people that live here, which is similar to what you'd find in many of the, the comparison cities we've seen, are working in what the census calls management of business, science, arts, and occupations. That's a lot of professional service jobs. Um, uh, and relatively, if you look at the occupational breakdown, many of those jobs are higher paying. Um, hence some of your, your higher uh, household incomes you have in this region. Um, so then we'll move on to uh, some of the real estate indicators we looked at as well as um, the commercial lands analysis and um, talking about the capacity of the city for growth in the future. Um, so how is office commercial multifamily performing in the city? Um, this is a, a commercial development pipeline, so this is going way back. Um, all the way back to the 1950s, and this is based on uh, a combination of, of data from CoStar, uh, which some of these data, data indicators are from, which is a proprietary um, uh, real estate data source, uh, and some of this is based on parcel data as well. Um, and what really strikes, uh, struck us and um, is probably relatively apparent to everyone is that a majority of the buildings, commercial buildings you have in the city um, were built be before 1990. Um, and what struck us is the big gap you had from 1990 to about 2010 in any form of commercial development. Um, and now you're starting to see some. Um, and so this number doesn't necessarily reflect everything that's been done up into today. Um, but uh, you've seen more commercial development uh, in the last few years than you did for 20 years. Um, but the, the character, the commercial, uh, commercial building character is largely defined by those buildings built in the 70s and 80s um, and dating back to the 60s as well. Um, which isn't uncommon for uh, this highway corridor, um, but this is pretty striking for us. Uh, the office vacancy, so I'll walk through office vacancy, retail, and then multifamily rents. In a small market like this, uh, they're sporadic, so all it takes is um, a few major le uh, lease ups or vacancies for the data to jump all over the place. Um, but I think uh, overall from a trend, what you're seeing in office vacancy is that you're typically low. There might be some spikes here and there, but um, relatively low office vacancy rates um, really since 2000. Um, obviously, you see a spike there with the recession. Um, and then with office rents, um, there's some gaps in the data, and that's what that graph generally indicates. Um, but they've hovered between 15 and $25 a square foot approximately. Um, and you really have such a limited office market here that that's a, a barometer of that, really. Um, relatively affordable uh, compared to some of the, the office markets in the region. Um, it's generally the story from that. Uh, retail vacancy, uh, you've seen a sharp decline in that over the last few years um, from a higher rate. Uh, you generally experience from 2010 to about 2015. Um, you've seen some strong lease up. Um, and Nancy and I were talking that was likely tied to some of the Kenmore Village occupancy. Um, and then from a retail rent standpoint, um, you've seen, you, you saw rents climb a bit in 2015, and then some of the data is indicating that they've come back down. I'd want to dive a little bit deeper into that. I think, uh, especially with retail rents, it's so location specific, building quality specific, that uh, it can really vary on from product to product. Um, that's generally the trends we're seeing here in terms of those two uh, commercial uses. Yeah. Could, I have a, could some of that be with um, the Lake, 
Lake Point property since the tenant, and I know they've rented out some of the uh, properties that they've purchased, that the developers purchased, maybe because they're short-term rents or leases, yeah. knowing that mm -hmm. it's going to be developed, maybe that's impacting the, mm -hmm. the lease amount. Yeah, that certainly could, especially in a relatively small market like this. Um, and so uh, a story that's been a little bit more consistent and there's more data on, I would say, is the multifamily. Um, and uh, you've seen a sharp, um, I don't want to say sharp, but a, a, a steady, polar opposite, uh, climb in multifamily rents in the city, uh, largely mirroring the type of climb you've seen regionally. Um, and then you see uh, uh, a bit of a, before some of the new apartments came online, you were at a approximately 4% vacancy rate, which was just above regional averages. Um, you saw a bit of an uptick in that once the buildings came online, and then that's kind of showing the uh, lease up of those buildings. But much like you find regionally, Kenmore is not immune to this, rents are rising. Um, and that's put uh, pressure on people uh, in terms of housing affordability, but it's also led to some of the multifamily development we've seen. Um, so another area which I found really interesting um, uh, is uh, looking at your taxable retail sales data and trade capture, so retail trade capture. And for the purposes of our analysis, we did uh, conduct an exercise called pull, uh, pull factors. Um, and really what this is, is evaluating your relative um, amount of taxable retail sales on a per capita basis um, compared to what people typically spend regionally. Um, so it's, it's a, a view of regional or local spending power um, and then how much is actually spent in your city. Um, so for the purposes of this, we estimated how much uh, the average person spends and then how much is actually being spent in Kenmore. Uh, a number at one indicates a relative balance that you're, you're capturing uh, uh, the majority or about approximately all of the spending power of your city um, in terms of your city's residents. Uh, a number below one means that that spending power is uh, happening or going elsewhere. That would indicate leakage. And a number above one indicates that you're drawing people from outside your city uh, to conduct their retail uh, shopping and spending. Um, so Kenmore is the first column. Uh, many of the categories are well below one. Um, certain categories might be fine if you're capturing a, approximately a third of the spending power of your residents. Um, that's, that might be a, a perfectly fine number. Um, some of these are relatively low. Uh, general merchandise stood out to me, and obviously general merchandise stores have proliferated in some of the other locations, and hence why you see, for example, such a high number in Woodenville. Um, and then Issaquah is another really strong number in that category, and those places are known as uh, big box retail centers. Um, so uh, this stood out to us. I, th I think it was interesting. It's, it hasn't changed a lot. Uh, we, we did a little bit of a different type of analysis, but um, in 2009 there was retail leakage occurring then too. Um, on electronics and appliance, 0.83 surprises me because I can't think of any electronic and appliance stores in Kenmore. Kenmore Camera might fit into uh, that. Okay. Yep. Yep. Does, does this count uh, internet sales? Uh, it does. I don't, let me make sure I included it or not. Um, so, for example, clothing, if, if, somebody, if, you, if you order a shirt at Amazon and it comes to your house, that, that wouldn't be captured there. That would would or would not? Uh, would not. That, that's a separate category. It's um, it's it's by NAICS. So these are all NAICS codes, uh, and uh, that's categorized in a an online retail category that we haven't included in this. Okay. Um, so that that's reflecting the fact that, and and that's a common story almost all, across a lot of communities is um, things like clothing and clothing accessory stores are, are dramatically impacted by Amazon and the online shopping. So. So, uh, so we don't have uh, a code here for online? It's, uh, it, we didn't include it. Um, let me make sure I didn't include it. Because that's a growing number. I could show that for sure. Um, okay. I'm happy to include that. It's, it's not a perfect category in terms of the way it's collected by NAICS category. Um, it's, uh, I don't know the exact NAICS, uh, but it's, it's kind of an other purchase category little bit of a catch-all, but it's significant. I'm happy to show that. It'd be interesting to see if it varies between any of these communities. Um, that'd be an interesting cross-comparison. You know, I was looking at... Yep. Now, Bothell...
Uh, that would be under food services and drinking. Um, the one thing I, I noticed that too, because this is suggesting you have a relatively ba balanced uh, gr mix of grocery stores. Um, one, uh, small convenience stores would likely fall into this category. And then two, your relatively small population Bothell's quite a bit bigger in terms of overall population. Um, and so Bothell certainly does have more grocery stores to support a, a fairly larger population. Yep, yep. I have a question on that. I had, I guess I had interpreted that as dining and I was curious about it too. So that is, is that strictly uh, retail um, uh, food? It's, it's, and it's, it's, it's your typical okay, so store. there is no dining aspect of that. No, that's all that's captured under food services. Okay, that's no. why I was thrown off then. Okay. okay. That, yep. Same thing happened to me. Okay. Yeah. We can add little notes on these too. One other question is this, I found this to, just this document to, or this data to be really interesting on this. Do you use this or do you see typically councils use this even just this one page as a, as a relevant part in, in just reevaluating zoning and everything? Because it, it seems like you could easily point to areas where you feel like you're adequately saturated or you're not, and you can start to kind of back into some strategies from that. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's certainly, uh, you, you can do customized trade capture analysis on a neighborhood level. Uh, for the city of Kenmore, it works quite well to do it as a city because you, don't, you have limited commercial areas. Um, but we've done that kind of, those kind of analytics, for example, in the city of Seattle. Uh, we've looked at trade capture, uh, coal factor type analyses on a uh, sub-neighborhood level to understand how is that neighborhood serving its, its trade area and how does that overlap with other trade areas. The data is readily available. You do have to do custom data requests and, and as a city, you're, you certainly are capable of doing that. Um, uh, I, I do think this is a good barometer, to, especially in the state of Washington where, uh, you know, retail sales are one of your your limited, your limited number of funding sources. Um, so understanding that performance, not just from a, a total number, but also on a, a per capita sense and how are your neighbors neighbors performing as well. It's, a, it's an interesting barometer for sure. This also um, begs the, the question about the fairness of our statewide tax policy. Um, it's been a few years, but last time I checked, Woodenville was collecting five times as much as Kenmore in per capita sales tax. And I get that they have those businesses that they need to serve and, you know, police and provide roads to, but do they really need that much more money to mm -hmm. serve those businesses? And what about the poor Kenmore residents that are going to Woodenville and paying all those taxes? Shouldn't we get something back coming to the citizens of Kenmore? Pre I-695, which was pre-1999, the state used to provide cities like Kenmore, what was called sales tax equalization, where um, they would actually say, oh, yep, we recognize that cities like Kenmore have their residents going into other cities and paying sales tax, so it makes sense for the state to provide an equalization payment back to cities like us. But I-695 got rid of that, so. Yeah, yeah. I could talk about that all night. <laughs> Thank you. Um, uh, so where I landed with, uh, I won't walk through all of this, I don't think we have quite have enough time, but uh, what I wanted to do is put uh, together a little bit of a framework in terms of these, what I'm calling sectors, um, uh, and what we thought based on the data we had collected um, were some of the opportunities and challenges we saw. Um, what I focused on was retail, uh, medical and healthcare, uh, professional services, which is really just office using space. Uh, restaurants, breweries, and wineries, especially with your location, you have a, a, a brewery district, but you're also next to um, uh, some regional destinations in terms of breweries and wineries. So I think it's really important for you to be thinking about that, which I know the city is. Uh, tourism and recreation, especially with the advent of uh, your new hotel, um, the Burt Gilman, uh, Kenmore Air, it's something that came up a lot in our uh, interviews. Um, and then thinking about the ICT uh, cluster and, and tech sector, more generally speaking. Um, there's not necessarily a strong presence here in Kenmore of that. You do have strong presence in nearby communities, ranging from all the way from Seattle to uh, places like uh, Kirkland um, and Bothell. Um, and what the strategy around that would be and, and identifying the idea that uh, there is potential, especially with regional demand, 
um, for Kenmore to play a role in that. Um, and you'll see that reflected in the strategies we've come up with. I'm um, happy to answer any questions about this or return to it if you want to. Um, but these are some of our thoughts and findings based on what we learned. Um, so getting into commercial capacity, uh, this is just to zoom in on your zoning. Um, and um, uh, what we did is we took this. This is a critical part uh, of our capacity analysis and our methodology. Um, we use zoning and we look at improvement values on a parcel by parcel basis. So the uh, improvements constructed on a site um, and uh, gauge based on that what the relative capacity for a, a site has and then whether it's uh, redevelopable or not to get to an overall uh, acreage of, of vacant and redevelopable lands and then we can also estimate um, how much capacity for employment um, those sites have and it's based on a uh, the regional framework the regional buildable lands uh, methodology a little bit of our own take on it to serve the purposes of this uh, this project in particular um, so this is where we landed um, there's kind of a lot of to look at here um, what I will say is that um, the sites in black um, are, are vacant sites. Uh, the sites in green and yellow are sites that we are calling in, in pink are what we're calling underutilized. Um, and uh, what we've done is rather than say uh, really black and white, if a certain site has this much of an improvement to it, it's, uh, it's, not, it's not redevelopable. Um, it's never quite that simple. Um, so what we've, we've included is uh, a tiering of, of sites based on their relative improvements uh, per square foot of land. And that gives you a little bit more of a range in terms of where capacity in the city might be based on what's been built in the city. Um, and then we also include a category for um, what we call uh, either uh, called pipeline. In, in, the cases of, in the case of this analysis, we're calling that preliminary project development. And Lake Point is really what stands out there. That's a huge critical part of the city's capacity. Um, and it's obviously the largest redevelopable site in the city and one of the largest in the region. So um, it's got a critical ro role here as well. Um, and the city had us do this as part of our scope for the project. Um, it served us well in understanding you know, how much land is available and where that is in the city. But it's also a good tool for the city um, because the city's required to do this. Um, and they will be by King County. Um, and so this will be a useful exercise for them, but it's also going to be a useful exercise um, for the city to be informed about this. You know, where is their capacity? Um, and, and be able to talk to the community, but also um, potential developers and investors. Sure. Inglewood should be 170. Interesting. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's on the other side yeah. of the of the street. Oh, okay, right. I see. Yeah. Um, we're using um, a street labeling base map so I could see them. They're not always perfect. I'm happy to change that. I have a Lori, do you have anything to add here? I think probably the only thing that I would add is that uh, we're required to do our buildable lands analysis periodically. We'll have to do it again in a few years prior to reviewing the comprehensive plan. The current um, plans do not include uh, redevelopment at uh, Plywood Supply. Uh, they do include numbers from the approved Lake Point permit, but Plywood Supply was not included in those numbers, so that could be an adjustment that could be considered for the next go round. Does I, I have a question? Underutilized, does that um, is that strictly improvements relative to land value, or is there if if something's generating sales tax? Or I'm looking at like Murphy as an example, mm -hmm. and where their improvements are next to nothing, yeah. but they actually generate significant business. Yeah. Um, so this isn't accounting for those economic activities that are uh, happening on a site-by-site -site basis. And that's where this is is an exercise in understanding from a built environment okay. standpoint. Uh, but there are a lot of lots. You know, we've done this exercise for areas in industrial, especially industrial zones, where that's really common, right. uh, where a site might be vacant, vacant, but it's used for storage. And that's a highly valuable use for that site. Uh, this, this exercise might not quite uh, have that come through as clearly 
Um, that said, especially in a, an urban location like this, like this, even if there is a highly valuable economic activity, thinking long term, that site still is uh, relatively unimproved and um, has, a, has, a more, has more likelihood to be developed than a property that has heavy improvements on it. Yep. Um, so it's useful still to, I think, at least understand that the state of that site. Okay. But that is a, that's a good question. Um, this is a summary table uh, of, of that analysis um, and uh, summarizing by uh, overall um, vacant and underutilized properties, the gross and net land supply, so subtracting out critical areas, uh, market factors, other, other things we fold into the analysis. Um, and then understanding the general capacity of those sites based on uh, general estimates of employment per potential uh, building square foot. So um, happy to talk about those more, but I'll, I'll move through this fairly quickly so we can uh, show you the goals uh, and strategies we've developed so far. Um, uh, we've conducted over a dozen interviews with different uh, types of stakeholders. Uh, I've also had a chance to meet with um, uh, the city's uh, uh, um, the city council actually, sorry, at your uh, council retreat in January, um, then individual interviews that I've conducted either on the phone or in person, uh, and also with the Kenmore Business Alliance. So uh, Nancy's been really helpful in um, setting those interviews up, and they've been really informative for me. This is a general summary. We have more detailed uh, review of what we've learned, but this has really been instrumental in the direction we've gone in terms of uh, goals and, and specific strategies and, and actions we've heard about or have learned about through our interviews. Um, we also had a public uh, comment tool that we posted online through the city's website. Um, and we had, I, ended up, I think we ended up with about 44 comments um, through the process. Um, and what we asked people to do is tell us about their, uh, their perceived opportunity, opportunities and challenges in the city um, and tell us where they were and um, allow people to see those through this interactive online tool. Um, this is a really general summary of what we heard, uh, and I won't walk through all of these. Um, what, what I will note is that there were many challenges that you could view as opportunities and vice versa. There's a, lot, a strong relationship there. Um, some people got really specific about specific uh, transportation improvements they want. Uh, others were broader comments, but it helped us get a little bit of a lay of the land from your general citizenry about uh, what their priorities, priorities are and um, where those are. So it was definitely an interesting exercise and helpful for us. Um, so, uh, the following pages, uh, I'll give you a preview of the goals we've uh, suggested, their working draft um, that we've developed um, through our work and then also the help of city staff uh, in their review uh, and, and suggestions. Um, and then also our, our, uh, our engagement with uh, businesses and your citizens. Um, so here are six goals. Um, your current plan calls for four goals, and we expanded on that a little bit. So I, I want to point that out. In that. Mm -hmm. And that's been an interesting conversation yes. for us <laughs> because um, what I've really appreciated from the council is for the last several years, economic development and, and implementing the strategy has been in your top five goals. And, and uh, I think it's been important to say, well, yeah, there's a strategy, but what – what about it? Uh, what's in it? And so having a digestible list of, of what are those what are those goals under it has I think really helped uh, you know, focus our efforts because it's because it was um, uh, the first one was promoting the the uh, city and so we've made investments in that um, that, that you've supported. Uh, one was downtown make a walkable downtown uh, again very very clear investments and support for that uh, support existing and new businesses and and uh, we've made good strides in that and then access to the water and, and so um, I think as Mark is going to highlight those those sentiments are still here and then there are a couple of new things to to focus on that are definitely related to the existing one, but still a pretty short list. Yep. Um, and, and Nancy's been really helpful in, in simplifying these goals, and I actually really like where they've landed so far in that they're, um, they're fairly targeted and succinct, um, and it makes it easier to organize and have a, a strategic framework for the city. Um, 
that provides an evaluation framework too for future opportunities and investments. Um, so promote and differentiate Kenmore's image. That's largely building from one of your, your, your initial, uh, your first goal from uh, your 2009 study. Um, and uh, really the first four goals largely reflect with a, an update, uh, your first four goals um, from your 2009 study. Where we depart a little bit is how we talk about um, development, commercial development, and we're a little more specific in goal three about office and mixed use um, than you were um, in your original plan. And that's something that's come through from city staff. It's also come through in our interviews and hearing that a little bit from the council so far. Um, uh, we also talk a little bit differently about access to the water um, and placemaking in general um, in your downtown. We broaden that a little bit. So goal four, we're talking about placemaking livability as a tool for economic development, which I think reflects uh, what we've heard and also reflects the original goals you had established uh, in 2009. Uh, where we've built out a little bit more specificity um, is goal five and six. Um, connectivity is a big part of what we learned about and what we see is an opportunity to continue to focus on. So it's, it is about accessing the waterfront, but it's also about creating connections to the new transportation uh, infrastructure that you're gonna be receiving as a city. Um, some of the uh, districts you have in your city, connecting to your brewery district, connecting to your, uh, your tourism infrastructure um, in the Burke Kilman Trail, for example. We see that as a really critical component. It's about the waterfront, but it's also about interconnecting all the different parts of the city especially in this, this commercial core you have. Um, and then from a, a business climate, um, everyone we spoke with uh, and a lot of what we heard online and through conversations was about the city's business climate being welcoming. Um, uh, going, coming from just working with city staff to the council and leadership. And that's a really critical, uh, we think, uh, asset for the city. And we wanted to make sure that came through loud and clear. Um, and that's an important component, especially as the region grows and other, other areas build out. And something we heard a little bit about, for example, with the restaurant community and seeking opportunities in places um, outside of the city of Seattle and Kenmore being a place, you're seeing it right next door, um, that's an easier place to work in. There's an opportunity to be here and, and Kenmore can uh, pick up on that and, and thrive from that. So those are, those are kind of our update on the goals and happy to answer any questions, um, get any of your thoughts. Uh, the next page is um, the strategies we've come up with um, nested under each one of those goals. Um, and we start getting a little bit more specific about how we think um, the city can be thinking about its, its economic development activity in the next five to 10 years. Under each one of these strategies, um, there are several um, even more specific actions that we're recommending that the city is um, evaluating right now actually. And so that's what we'd be diving into a little bit deeper um, at the next city council meeting. Um, and so uh, there's kind of a lot to digest right now. I don't think I'll walk through all of these except to say that all of these strategies are meant to build towards the goals we've identified. Um, and we're certainly in draft form right now and, and want your feedback as much as possible. And uh, the city's feedback so far has been really valuable for us. So looking forward to incorporating that um, even more so. Um, this takes off a little bit on Brent's comment. I mean, have you found it useful for cities to um, more or less specialize or, or be more generalist. I mean, we yeah. saw the, you know, how we were doing relative to other cities on the various categories. Yeah. Um, if there's a specific, for example, if a city has a really strong industry cluster or a, it's, a, it's more of a company town, so city of Redmond and the, the impact that uh, Microsoft is, has in, is having, I think there can be some what you'd call specialization around those, those industries. Um, I think for a, a smaller city in a community like Kenmore, there can be specialization around uh, your location and quality of life. That does feel a little bit all-encompassing. I think every city should be thinking about that. But not every city has access to a lake or a trail infrastructure that you have. Um, so I think there can be elements of specialization that make every plan a little bit unique amongst cities. Um, but I don't think there's any silver bullet um, specialization component to this that, I, that, that we're, we're identifying for the city. I think there's a lot of good things happening. I think um, there is a sense of place that the city could continue to build on um, that we've heard a lot about that I, I think we want to make sure is coming through in this. Yeah, I, I found um, in going through these goals and then how you uh, looked at the strategies, it was goal number three was the one that kind of stuck out as 
the most um, the most unique relative to how we've approached things in the past. I feel like that, that was a, that's a pretty specific goal that we've sort of talked about this in roundabout ways, but we've never really addressed it in any way. And, and so I, um, I found that goal within the appropriate strategies um, um, following that to, to be an interesting area to maybe put a little more focus on. Because I felt like a lot of the other goals were either, even though they are kind of rephrased or looked at a little differently. There, some of them, they're happening just organically and some are happening just because of our, the way we're approaching our planning and everything. Mm -hmm. But um, number three was the most interesting addition, I felt. Well, I, I think that speaks to kind of what's been happening over the last several years too, is that we've kind of started to set the table. And now it's, uh, it, it makes some sense to think about, okay, are there things that that the city should be considering around incentives or you know more targeted re recruitment or or marketing um, to to bring in you know what I hear every day is I wish there was more office here uh, and and the the calls that I get uh, from from businesses who are expanding uh, who are here or uh, who are interested in coming here. So it's, uh, I, th I think as in all of this, we have to be very intentional about it. So this, yeah, this is a little bit of a, you know, next step kind of goal. And I'm obviously new to the entire process, but would just like to briefly highlight the voice, uh, the voices that uh, I heard uh, on the campaign trail and also having being one of two council members who grew up in the city the most striking thing I saw from your um, at least the the presentation was Kenmore is a bedroom community and I would like to at least speak on behalf uh, of a growing smart and uh, growing with some heart in this whole thing I see a, a lot of many goals that that seem to emphasize and emphasize again economic development um, repeatedly and I think there's a way to do that and encourage that and it of course is desirable in a balance with all of our other goals of what makes this place unique which is our environment our unique water access and conserving the best of what we've got hey, Councilmember Curtis just to comment on um, Strategy 2B, leverage outdoor recreation and other assets to grow tourism in Kenmore. I've mentioned off and on over the years that we have two totally different ecosystems for bird watching and nature. So the wooded area of St. Edwards is totally different than the swamp, um, Swamp Creek Basin. And so if there was anything easy that could be done to get people into the swamp so they could see those birds, uh, pretty easy to get to St. Edward Park. But I think we could, um, th there are people who actually go places to see birds of a variety and they keep their little journals and they try to find as many as they can. Thank you. Any other questions? I do have one other question regarding the, uh, the um, high percentage of residents who work outside of the city. In your, when you're typically working on these strategies, is that something that um, just some communities just accept? I mean, obviously you can't change that dramatically because you've got limited limitations on, on zoning and where, how your land's laid out. But I'm just curious if that is just how, how you see other cities that have that a pretty extraordinarily low percentage that work in the city, that live in the city, how they address that. I think uh, uh, typically it's, it's, it's not necessarily viewed as uh, an issue to address as much as it is as a city or re-enabling people to be able to live and work if they want to in the same community. So that opportunity to do that as a city, as part of our strategic framework and our investment, can we, if the desire is there for that, which it's the general sense is that if, if at least some people would enjoy that, not have to commute in entire planning framework that we have of of trying to um, 
limit congestion and have people be able to conduct more uh, economic activities in town centers and concentrated retail environments and commercial environments. Um, it's, it's, it's a part of that framework. Um, but we don't typically see a city set specific goals or performance measures to change that framework. Um, that number will change if you have more office, for example, or more employment opportunities. So it's usually viewed in that framework. Um, if you start seeing more companies located here and your employment increase, those are generally positive economic activities and you'll start seeing people, there's more of an opportunity to actually do that, live and work in the same community. Uh, that's not for everybody. Um, and it does take a lot to dramatically change that. Um, especially in, in the case of Kenmore, that's a, that's a pretty small number, but a lot of communities are in that 8%, 10% range. It wouldn't take too much to change that in a, a smaller community like Kenmore. Um, but that's usually how it's talked about. We're starting to run out of time oh, here. Uh, Councilman Shrevenick and then uh, Councilmember Curtis. Yeah, just a, just a quick question. Yeah. So is, does goal three uh, cover retail as well? And if so, in what strategy? Um, um, we're talking about in the frame framework of mixed use, um, but uh, I don't know if we've called it out as maybe as quite as clearly as it, it could be in terms of having a specific strategy around retail and, and the quality of retail and how that's done. Yeah, thank you. There, there is in strategy 2A, yeah. speaks to community scale re retail. Yeah, and that's talking, we, we've put it in the context of, of grow new and existing businesses and, and re retail recruitment. And we've looked at recruitment in kind of two, two categories, bigger recruitment efforts, that big, that big satellite office um, or tech office, um, and then small scale businesses, uh, community-based businesses, more akin to what you're seeing um, with your new restaurant in Seaplane. Um, but I think it, it, does, it could have a place in goal three as, as well. So it's mm -hmm. good feedback for us. That's where we're Curtis. So mine's kind of related. Um, the council, hopefully representing our citizens well, over the years has sort of stood against large retail outlets. And is that still your sense as you've gathered information from citizens and interested groups that, that we're on track, that we should still limit big box stores and other large retail? Um, to be honest, we haven't had a lot of conversation with people about uh, the format of, re of retail. I don't think we I can say with, with confidence that we haven't had, whether it's through the, the public comment we received or our conversations with city staff and, and, and stakeholders, that anyone's been pushing for large format retail or big box retail. Um, that said, those, the, the new format from a, as a, a, my expertise and my experience is there's new formats of retail that fit that, that big box uh, format. Um, actually, an example I was reading about on the way here is the new small format Target coming to Ballard in an office development. Um, I think that's where you're seeing retail evolve so much. And um, uh, we haven't actually heard it um, from our work with the local community, but we're seeing those kinds of trends in other places um, where the, how large format or big box retail is being done, is, it's evolving, especially in more urban communities. So kind of related, is it okay for cities to say, it's okay with, our, with us if our folks go somewhere else and buy their stuff? It's, it's okay if, uh, as a policy decision, if you want to <laughs> promote that. I think, you know, there's the, um, what Rob is speaking to, which is the, 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 the fiscal drivers in our state, um, and retail's one of those for cities, so it's a real balance there. Um, and cities really benefit from having those big box, and there are cities that, their, their entire economic development strategy is getting those businesses. Um, that's obviously not necessarily the fit for Kenmore, um, but there could be something in between. Um, just quickly on number five, and I see you've got two things on 5A and 5B sure. on uh, some of the strategies there. And I'm just curious, given the renewed interest in uh, reviving an old form of transportation to help uh, alleviate a lot of the traffic problems, King County Exec now is pushing for ferries. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. seeing as how we're like first on the passenger only ferry district, I don't see anything here uh, indicating that uh, this could be in the multimodal uh, multimodal travel uh, with ferries. And yeah, I find that a little disappointing. We'll, we'll definitely add that in. And, you know, again, more specific actions uh, under, under each of these strategies. We can expand we, I, I on that. I do believe we have some uh, a strategy reflecting the potential for ferries, or not a strategy, but an action that's nested in there. But um, perhaps it can be elevated as a, as a broader strategy. And because I do think, um, as a ferry commuter, I think it's uh, a, a great. Asset to have. A tremendous asset to have. 
Yeah. Mm -hmm. So definitely. All right. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Thanks very much. Thank you. It's really helpful. Um, See you on the twenty fifth. All right. Um, now we officially call the uh, regular um, committee back to order again. And if the clerk please take the roll. Councilmember Marshall. Present. Councilmember Danuski. Here. Councilmember Smith. Here. Deputy Mayor Herbig. Here. Councilmember Curtis. Present. Councilmember Shrebnik. Here. Mayor Baker. Here. Um, if you would uh, please rise and uh, join me in the uh, Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance. Next item on the agenda is in the approval of the agenda. If there is no objections, the, stand, the agenda will stand approved as written. Um, okay, next item on the agenda is uh, a presentation of Puget Sound uh, Clean Air Agency. Uh, Craig Ken, with the, the executive director. But I'd also like to call State Representative uh, Jerry Paletta. We've got, uh, we've got him in the audience tonight. We're very grateful for that. And uh, we certainly want to take advantage of the knowledge he has. So. Welcome. Welcome, Representative. As we expect to be here, I'm called up, so pardon my informal dress. <laughs> you are dressed just fine. Good evening, Mayor Baker, members of the council. As the mayor said, I'm Craig Kenworthy. I'm the executive director of the Clean Air Agency. I'm going to cover a number of topics with you this evening. That is if I can properly throw down here. Let's see. Just arrow. Okay. The arrows. Uh, I'm going to talk about the agency, just a brief overview of what we do. I'm going to talk about odor issues in the city and in particular about the asphalt plant situation and also talk about the overall air quality issues in the city. So our agency is a regional four county agency. We're chartered by the state legislature. This is the vision that our board created for the agency. Our board are representatives from the four counties and then a representative from the largest city in each of the counties, and then one member of the public at large who's typically been someone with a background in public health that are appointed by the elected officials that consist of the rest of the board. So we do both enforce air quality regulations and also do voluntary programs, and I'm going to talk about enforcement and compliance issues when I talk about asphalt. We also do education and outreach for the public on clean air and climate-friendly choices. So this is what we typically, when we talk about pollution in our region, the pollutant we worry the most about at a regional level is called PM2.5 or, or fine particulate, and that is the size of the particle. As you can see from this slide, the gray is a human hair. The blue dot is what we call PM10. That's the size of the particle, which is typically dust. So, for example, eastern Washington will have a dust storm and it will have a PM10 problem from dust blowing off agricultural land. PM2.5 is the red, red dot on there. The issue with PM2.5 is it's so small that it can actually pass not just into your lungs but into your bloodstream. It has an inflammatory effect. There are also some types of PM2.5 which have heavy metals in them, carcinogens like diesel pollution. So it's both a pollutant that can cause inflammation on one hand just from being the size that it is and high levels of it, but also some toxins related to the constituents of it. So as I mentioned, this is the most critical pollutant in our region. It's been shown not just to have an effect on lung health also heart attacks and strokes. It's now been determined to be causal of heart attacks and strokes. There's increasing evidence that being exposed to high levels of PM2.5 for pregnant women can have a detrimental effect on the fetus for long-term development after that. So we increasingly focus on this particular pollutant. As a general matter, we have hot spots for this pollutant across our region. Where we see the highest levels of this are either in heavy industrial areas like the Duwamish River Valley in Seattle or in certain pockets of the region where there's a lot of wood burning in the winter. So our highest levels actually of PM2.5, for example, in the last few years have been places like Darrington and Snohomish County, some other pockets of that county. We were over the federal standard for this in Pierce County, again, largely due to wood burning at one point. As a general matter, there's an annual federal standard on this, and we are well under that standard as a region. So what we're really concerned about are days where we have high, very high levels of that pollution that typically occurs when we've got an inversion going on or stagnant air going on, pollution levels will build up. As a, 
as an overall matter, we actually have pretty good air quality most of the year <coughs> because we have wind and rain, right? So I'm the guy in the winter that's really happy when it's windy and raining uh, because it's clearing out the air pollution. So asphalt, let me talk a little bit about sort of the, the background in this. I'm gonna talk about sort of the regulatory system on this. So I mentioned PM 2.5, as you can see on the slide. Asphalt also includes PM 10. PM 10 is an irritant, but you can't really get it deeply into your lungs. What we call hazardous air pollutants, which can contain some heavy metals and other organic compounds, including sulfur dioxide, nitrogen oxides, carbon monoxide, volatile organic compounds, and I'll explain a little bit more about that in a minute. So some of those pollutants, we have a federal standards for say sulfur dioxide, nitrogen oxides, and carbon monoxide that we have to attain across the region. We can't be over a certain number for those standards at a regional level. So when I'm talking about this, I'm talking about the particular emissions from one source. An emission from one source like that does not typically drive us over those federal levels. It takes accumulation of all of those sources. That can be mobile sources, transportation. That could be what we call area sources like wood burning. It could be stationary sources like a particular industrial plant. So how does EPA set the standards? And as a general matter, while we are able to put some regulations in place in some cases, for a lot of our stationary sources, we use the EPA standard under the Federal Clean Air Act. EPA gets to set a national standard for certain types of facilities, and then our job is to implement and enforce that standard in parts of the state where there's not a regional or local agency. It's our Department of Ecology's job. So when the Federal Clean Air Act was passed, basically Congress said to the sources, you have to meet a particular standard that's in effect when you go into operation, or if you were already in operation before the act was passed in the early 70s, you have to meet that particular standard. If you change your operation in a significant way by expanding, or in some cases relocating, or a new source moves in, you then need to meet whatever standard is in place at that point in time. So if a source is operating previously and they're meeting the older standard, we are very limited in our ability to tell them, no, you need to meet a newer standard that's in place unless EPA updates that standard. For this type of asphalt plant that we're talking about in Kenmore, the last time EPA updated the standard was 1979. So that gives you a sense that they are operating, and as are a lot of the other asphalt plants we have in our region, because we have 20 of them, they're operating under those older standards. So we look for other opportunities to leverage up trying to get change when we have issues with communities being impacted by sources. And one of the ways that we do that, this acronym stands for Notice of Violation. So we have the authority to enforce existing air quality standards, but we can't necessarily force them to go to new or higher standards. What we can do in some cases, though, we have general nuisance authority. If someone's causing a nuisance for the community from either odor or air pollution, we can write a Notice of Violation ticket and say, you're causing an impact on the community and start a dialogue with the source. We can collect civil penalties under notice of violation. That's not actually our goal. What we prefer to do is leverage that possibility of a civil penalty into a business being in a conversation with us about, okay, what could you do to improve to avoid this situation happening again? I'm gonna talk about some specifics on that related to this plant and other asphalt plants in just a second. I want to emphasize, though, how important the city's assistance and the memorandum of understanding we have with the city has been on this, because to issue a notice of violation, we have to have qualified personnel who observe that there's an odor at a certain level, they're able to trace it back to the source, and they're able to say that it was significant enough to cause a level of harm or impact on a resident. That either has to be one of our inspectors or someone that is qualified, another government employee who's qualified to say, yes, I've experienced this, so we can then move to the notice of violation. We have 12 inspectors to cover the four counties. They do everything from inspecting Boeing facilities to do burn ban enforcement in the winter. So it's been really helpful to have the city working with us on this so that someone can deploy more quickly if there's a complaint and look at whether we've got an odor issue and then follow up and, and start the process for the notice of violation. And if I could just jump in just to, just to remind everybody, those who may be new or uh, not know about this, we do have a pretty unique arrangement with Puget Sound Clean Air Agency. It might be just Kenmore and maybe one other city that in your service area, where uh, we have an interlocal agreement where um, Puget Sound Clean Air Agency has sort of, in, in my words, deputized city employees and trained them to go and respond to nuisance odor complaints. 
And so instead of waiting an hour and a half for uh, a Puget Sound Clean Air Agency person who might be down in Pierce County to come to an incident, uh, the, citizen, the citizen can actually call Kenmore City Hall and we can usually have somebody on site within 10 minutes. And what, uh, what our role is report taking only. So we're trained to, our, our, our employees are trained to smell the odor and then gauge it accordingly and write it down. Then we turn that report into Puget Sound Clean Air Agency and then they do the enforcement from that point on. The, the city doesn't actually do the, the enforcing, we just do the report writing and the responding, uh, but we turn enforcement over to Puget Sound Clean Air Agency. And this arrangement that we've had with Puget Sound Clean Air, Clean, Clean Air Agency has resulted in some responses by the city and uh, at least one enforcement action. So, Right, and just to, to tell you about what the system is when we have nuisance odors. So I sometimes get this question about using technology to monitor nuisance odors. We are closer to artificial sight than we are to artificial noses. We've experimented with some nose technology, but there's 3,000 sensors in, in your nose for picking that up. So we have to use a human-based system. Our decisions, by the way, go to what's called the Pollution Hearings Control Board if someone disputes them. That board has upheld our human-based system as long as someone has been trained and qualifies. Our inspectors actually have to pass a smell test every year. They have to show they can distinguish between different types of odors and the intensity of those odors. So it's been really helpful to have the city on that. We've done that with a couple of other locations, typically on burn ban enforcement in the winter, where we had a severe problem and we couldn't cover the entire area. So again, it's been really helpful to leverage that up. And one of the reasons that's been particularly helpful is, as I mentioned, so, and I wanna, I wanna give a, a shout out to Representative Paulette on this, there's been ongoing conversation about legislation on this that led to a dialogue about what are the things that asphalt plants could be doing in a different or better way. So I'm gonna talk about this for just a minute, but some of this is super technical. I'm not gonna go into all the detail on it. But what we did was at the urging of Representative Paulette through the conversations he caused with the legislature is we began to work on a report about best management practices for asphalt plants. Again, we have about 20 of these in our region and what could we do to reduce the likelihood of odors impacting residents? So what I will say on that is if you think about a typical asphalt plant, there's really three ways to reduce the risk of odors leaving the site. There's one, don't cause them in the first place. There's two, reduce the likelihood they will escape. So if you look at these examples, say covered loads leaving the site is an example of reduce the likelihood they will escape. And then third, use active capture, what we typically call catch and don't release, where you actually have a technology system where you, s you actually literally suck it into a filter system or a capture system and it never goes off the site. So some of these things are a mix of those technologies. What I can tell you is on where you see the average on this slide is the average is typically those older asphalt plants that are already operating that do not have requirements for stepping up to the next level of technology. When you look down this list, one of the notes is that on asphalt transportation, we as an agency have authority over our stationary sources. We have very limited authority over something once it starts rolling. We do not have authority over mobile sources typically. That's usually EPA sets a particular standard on a mobile source. So when we're talking about, for example, the issue of covered or uncovered loads, we are really limited in our ability to do that. Even if a new asphalt plant showed up tomorrow, submitted a permit application for, for their plant, we would not necessarily have the ability to say, you need to cover your loads as soon as they leave the site. Our authority essentially ends at that site boundary. When we look at this list for the existing plant, one of the things that we've been concentrating on is shifting them from hot mix to warm mix because that goes back to reducing the likelihood of emissions. That hot mix tends to put off more volatile organic compounds, produces more odor issues. The reason I went to that example is that they have shifted to warm mix but it's not in their permit. And we've been having a conversation with them about resolving some notice of violation tickets that we have with them. And instead of them paying a civil penalty, getting them to permanently commit to 
the warm mix because we think it has been making a difference in terms of the number of complaints we've been getting and reducing the likelihood of complaints. So that's just one example. I, I know our head inspector was having a conversation with them last Friday and they were supposed to be talking about it today. As soon as I know more about whether we got that resolved, we'll give an update to, to Rob and then to you overall on that. But that's one of the tactics we end up using is, is looking at those notice of violations and saying, well, you can either pay us a penalty or you can work with us to prevent this from happening going forward. So again, there's a number of these that we would be engaged in conversation with sources about. For, from our perspective, the warm mix does make a significant difference at this point. This particular plant uses a little bit of partial capture on the silo loading. They have the ability to pull some things into the bag house that they have on site. That's a relatively small percentage of their total use that they can pull that in on. So that one is not going to make a huge difference in that regard, but we will continue going forward to look at whether we can leverage up any of the other changes in that regard. So I'm actually going to move off yeah, asphalt, sir. so let me make sure I pause and see what questions you've got. Question. Yeah, Councilman Shrebnik. Uh, yeah, it was on the previous um, slide. Is there is there any more information, well, a few things. Is there any more information about um, where our current plant is on these things? That would be great to have, you know, just highlighted on all those categories, like where is our current plant? Um, what things more or less contribute to the fumes and what are the costs associated with moving from left to right? So the, the, I'll go to the cost question first. Basically, almost all the existing asphalt plants are on the left side of the column right now, okay. right? They're using passive condensers at this point. Um, they are using that partial capture that I talked about where they can capture some of the potential fumes and volatile organic compounds coming off. That's the enclosure on the silo loading. Right now, they do not have an enclosure on their truck loading. They have two different places to, to load. Those are both open bay doors in that regard. Um, and on the, the batch mix, they use a, what we call a pug mill where they drop the mix in. That's under the drum mixers. There's a partial enclosure and a limited flow capture on that one, on that what we call the counter flow design. That's a relatively small percentage of the amount of material they can put through. We're talking about 5 to 10% capture of that. It's not a, a super high capture rate. And then the, the covered load, uncovered load, um, I think they've been working on some covering on that. But again, we don't monitor when they leave the, the site in that regard. I know we've talked to Representative Paulette about this a little bit too, that there's an issue here of sort of a gap of the city's authority to regulate that under state law, our inability to regulate that once it leaves the site under state law as well. So for this particular plant, there's a little bit of capture going on, but really the, the key change lately has been moving them towards the warm mix on the, the more advanced controls. That's made the biggest difference. So the question of the covered, uncovered loads. Is that something the state legislature could actually change or it's a national level issue? So setting aside for a moment whether there's any interstate commerce or other legal complications associated with that, my understanding is the legislature could decide to allow the cities to have more authority over covering loads in that regard. And I don't know whether Representative Collette wants to, to jump in on that one or not. I, I generally operate on the assumption the legislature can, can shift that if they want to, and it's a question of whether they would do that. I'm sorry, uh, and Pete, we're not preempted by federal law from adopting covering requirements or enclosure requirements. Um, so it is a matter that the state legislature could f try to fill these gaps. Yeah, and, and this somewhat ironically, we might be closer to preemption than you are because of the limitations on our ability to control mobile sources. Someone could make an argument we are trying to back into controlling mobile sources when the Federal Clean Air Act pretty clearly says that we can't control mobile sources. Councilmember Smith. Yeah, I have, uh, two questions. One is, is um, I noticed your, the notice of violations were based on the smell. Is there any relationship between the smell and actually the PM 2.5 pollutants? I mean, I would think just because it smells doesn't mean it's bad, and then other times maybe it's bad, but it doesn't smell. I'm just trying to understand. Yeah, exactly. So, so one thing I want to make sure I say is odor issues affect people differently, right? So we could have a time when we have a volatile, what we call a volatile organic compound, which is an organic compound that has an odor to it, 
it could really affect someone and people do vary on this. So I never want to say that it's not affecting someone's health because some people are just affected a lot more. Example I can give is if we had a rendering plant, right? And if you've ever been next to a rendering plant before, wow, uh, that really, really will affect you. So sometimes, yes, something we can smell may not be the PM 2.5. The PM 2.5 doesn't necessarily smell by itself. The parts of it would smell, say a diesel smell. Those volatile organic compounds really are what produces a lot of that odor effect. So if you think about when you pump gas, benzene leaks out a little bit, no matter what we do on the controls, and you get that kind of benzene smell in that regard. So there could be times, for example, there's a lot of PM 2.5 in an area, and you're not going to notice it or smell it because it's so small you really can't see it. And you can actually have harmful levels that you can't see. So it isn't one or the other. It can be smells that are not necessarily high levels of PM 2.5, and it can be high levels of PM 2.5 that you really wouldn't detect with your nose. Okay, it's partly it, dependent on the, what it's made out of. And there's really no way t for us, is there any monitoring that goes on on the non-smell aspect then? So we do monitor for PM 2.5 at various monitors in the region. One of our challenges is trying to pin that to a particular location when there are multiple emitters of PM 2.5. So for example, vehicle traffic, diesel trucks, other pollution stationary sources will emit PM 2.5. So it's hard to trace it to a particular source sometime if it's somewhat ubiquitous in the atmosphere overall. We can measure the overall level in the air, but it's much more complicated and challenging to say this much PM 2.5 is coming off of a particular source, especially if it's got other sources nearby. Okay, I, I, that makes sense then. And then the other question I had is, on a, when, they, when they were operating with an, a non-conforming standard because it was set back in the 70s, can they continue to replace virtually every component and aspect of their operating system and still remain under a non-conforming standard? It, this is a, not a simple question. If they expand production by a certain amount or change certain pieces of equipment, we can trigger a review of the permit. It somewhat depends on what we call the emission unit. So it depends on what part that they're changing out. They couldn't wholesale replace everything. They could replace certain things, though, and it wouldn't necessarily trigger the permit part of it. So it's dependent on whether it's a mission unit of a ter certain type or whether they're changing in such a way as to expand production past a certain level. And do they have to report to you when they change any one of these components? They have certain requirements in their permit about things that they do have to report to us if they're making a change, and that comes back to the emission unit component of, okay, we're running this particular piece of equipment, now we want to wholesale change it out. They need to tell us about that. But there are other pieces, like if they just said we're changing all the doors on the bay loading area or we're changing the chute, for example, they don't have to tell us about every particular change. I will tell you that the inspectors, when we have problems in areas, spend a lot more time walking around the site and seeing whether anything is different. So we typically spend a lot more time on on-site inspections to see if someone has changed something, if we've had continuing problems with them. Would it, um, so knowing that, and the fact that the inspectors have to actually make that observation tells me that they're not always forthcoming with the changing of components. Would it at all, is there, do you ever see a municipality create a, an ordinance that would actually require um, a permitting of any type of replacement or anything just to, so that you understood and knew what was going on at the facility? So I haven't seen that particularly related to this type of source and part of that is whether there's something else that the city is already permitting on the site that has some relationship to that. So th whether there's an overlap in effect between a city permit in, in that regard, it would be somewhat for the legislature to determine whether they would want to cross the stream, so to speak, of having two different permitting systems over the same piece of equipment. In general, they've handed that to us. Okay. So it's usually we have to deal with that particular. We can, if someone doesn't tell us about something they're supposed to tell us about, they can also get a notice of violation for that. All right. Thank you. Any other questions? So I'm, I'm going to, oh, sorry. City I, I just want to reiterate something Mr. Craig Mr. Kenworthy said earlier, and that is um, the asphalt plant here in Kenmore has voluntarily taken steps to uh, mitigate the odor, and we think it has made a difference. We are seeing less complaints. Um, so like you mentioned a minute ago, uh, they've gone from the hot mix to the warm mix. Uh, they also changed the uh, source where they get that petroleum, and it, it is a um, better smelling type of uh, petroleum. Um, and then they, it, 
uh, they're in the process of requiring covered loads for all of their customers. Uh, I think they were going to mandatory here pretty soon if they're not mandatory already. And they're mandatory. Yes, nodding your head back there. So those three things are pretty significant voluntary measures that they've taken um, on their own, uh, and we appreciate that. Yeah, and we want to continue, as I said, to look for those opportunities to lock those in because they have been voluntary measures, and we'd like to get that in as a permanent agreement. Councilmember Marshall. Does our asphalt plant emit any carcinogens uh, or any other substances that are dangerous to our human health, and if so, how much, and is it monitored? So I'll answer the last question first. For stationary sources, we have emission standards over how much they can emit. And again, because some of those chemicals are ubiquitous in the air, we don't monitor the particular source in that regard, except in very rare circumstances. So for example, we had a, a glass, colored glass facility in Woodenville that was pouring heavy metal in to make the colors in the heavy glass. Sometimes in those cases, we literally would get up on the stack and measure what was going out, although the better thing was to measure how much lead was going in and to the process. So in that sense, it's not monitored on that particular site. There are what we call hazardous air pollutants. So yes, there are chemicals that have been implicated in terms of potential risk. The standard EPA sets limits how much they can emit of that. Um, but it, so it's generally designed to limit how much they can emit. Again, cumulative exposure is really critical on that component of it. So you'd need to look at if you, I, mean, I, wouldn't, I would not want to ever say one particular source causes cancer when we have a bunch of other sources that contribute some of those same types of pollution in that regard. So there are hazardous air pollutants, though, that have been implicated, some of those in terms of increased cancer risk, but that's part of an overall exposure that someone might have. So in particular, does this plant, this asphalt plant, uh, do you think, uh, does it, at a regular course of business, emit any, any carcinogens? So it, it, it does emit some chemicals, again, which have been linked to that, and that's true of a lot of our industrial sources. So if, if anyone came here in a gasoline-powered car, they also emitted benzene, which is a known carcinogen. So this source does emit some of those volatile organic compounds and those hazardous air pollutants. But as do most of our industrial sources in the region under a standard of you can't emit more than X amount of those, and essentially you can't emit, you can't add any more risk than X amount to the cumulative risk that a member of the public might be exposed to overall. So I'm just going to touch briefly on overall air quality. So we have federal standards that I mentioned for PM 2.5. We focus a lot on diesel PM because diesel is a carcinogen and exposure to diesel PM is a known cancer risk. There's also a federal standard for what we call smog or ozone. So smog is not a direct pollutant. It's what happens when you put volatile organic compounds in the air and expose them to heat and sunlight. So if you think about that, we don't tend to have as much smog or ozone as, say, Southern California because we do not have as much heat and sunlight in the summer. We do have higher levels of ozone in eastern King County, which is caused largely by the emissions in western King County, cooking in the atmosphere and drifting. But we're meeting all of those current federal air quality standards. And also, obviously, we have a lot of greenhouse gas emissions in the region. So we focus a lot on cleaning up diesel in the region. We've brought a lot of federal grants in to clean up everything ranging from older trucks to actually adding auxiliary cleaner engines on tugboats in the harbor, getting to cleaner port trucks, moving towards alternative fuels, including electric vehicle fuels. Some of you may remember that there is now a state alternative fuel rule where local governments are supposed to move to electric or biofuel vehicles to the extent practicable for new vehicle purchases. We are a resource on that for the cities that don't have as much staff capacity on that across the region. So. If the city has questions about alternatives there that it wants to look at, use cases on particular vehicles for your fleets, we're absolutely there. We have staff that work on this issue to provide you with, with information and assistance on that. We've talked about stationary sources. Our board has focused a lot on greenhouse gas emission reductions, not just for the climate, but also because we get co-benefits, electric vehicle, no emissions from the tailpipe, no greenhouse gas emissions, none of those carcinogens that we were talking about. So speaking of electric vehicles, so um, I understand there was a constituent question about electric vehicle charging in the city. This is a map, it's from an app called PlugShare that shows you where all the electric vehicle chargers are in the region. The green ones are sort of standard speed chargers and the orange ones are high speed chargers where you can get about 50 miles range back in less than a half an hour. So 
I just wanted to say we also have some of our transportation staff that work with the cities on where they might want to site electric vehicle chargers and give council advice on that. So I pulled up this map to sort of show obviously there's the St. Edward Park one, but where the space sort of exists around Kenmore and Briar and parts of Bothell of not having as much EV infrastructure. I, since I sat in on your economic development presentation for a little bit, I will just say that one of the things that we see sometimes is electric vehicle owners will go do business and buy where the charger is, right? So it's actually an opportunity to attract electric vehicle owners. It's not just Tesla's. I came in the agency Chevy Bolt with a B, which is a 238 mile range on a single charge electric vehicle. So we're, we're moving from the era where you had to have 50 or $70,000 to if you have 30 some thousand dollars, you can get a 238 mile range car. So just to offer up that if there's help we can provide on helping add out that in EV infrastructure, we'd absolutely love to do that. So what, what did you call us? You called us an EV charging? I said you were sort of the donut hole in one part of that. Oh, that you called us, I think you said, in, in, in my meeting with you, you said we were a desert. Well, yes, a little bit, but yeah. you do have the St. Edward charger. Um, yeah. what, what we typically find is you really want to get chargers in some locations where people will spend some time to. So with a high-speed charger, you don't really need that much time. If you've ever driven by it, though, you will see some of those orange dots are Fred Meyer grocery stores where they've realized, wow, that person's going to plug in for 20 minutes e or 30 minutes even in a high-speed charger, and they're going to go in the store and, and spend money. We, our, our summer graduate intern has that on his to-do list to start working on that. So. The good news is there's going to be some additional state money available on that because as part of the Volkswagen settlement, which I did not take the time to talk about today, but as you all know, Volkswagen decided not to actually meet the emission standards and is <laughs> having to pay $112 million to Washington because we had the fifth highest number of those violating vehicles. The legislature has set a process for how to figure out what to do with that. Part of that process, though, is the state can use up to 15% of that $112 million for electric vehicle charging infrastructure. So there's actually going to be a process available for the cities to seek some funding to do that. It looks like Alderwood now is also a desert. Yes, yes. It's not that every place that you can spend money has, the, has that infrastructure, absolutely. And so is the legislature going to figure that out next session? on how to distribute that money. It's actually that, that they gave guidance to a college, Department of Ecology and Commerce and Transportation to set up a system of where to put the EV charging. They, they oh. basically said you can use that 15% of 112 million for that infrastructure, mm -hmm. and then those departments will work on where to do it. So the legislature has already given the guidance, now it's up, it's up to the uh, departments. Right, okay. to implement. Okay. So I'm gonna pause there and see what questions you've got about anything I've talked about or any other issues related to air quality or, or climate. Don't appear to be any. So if you do ever want more information, our strategic plan is listed up here. If you've ever got a question, please let Rob know. If you've ever got anything you want to ask about or you get a constituent question on air quality, I'd love to, to help out with that. So, Representative Flett, anything to add? I expect to keep working with the agency on improving the and uh, President Keene's very generous with time with me last week and one of the things that I left that conversation with is there have been concerns over the limitations on the existence of the <laughs> um, uh, limited to taking control of property only. Um, I was wondering if this and so Just to clarify, our interpretation of what state law authorizes for us is that if someone has an, a possessory interest, it doesn't have to be an owner, for example, it could be someone leasing. So 
the Burke is a little bit different. For, for example, if a soccer club was leasing a park and they would sort of have the exclusive possessory interest in using that part of it, we do think we could write that ticket. But we do think there are some constraints on writing tickets when someone doesn't have some exclusive right to be present because the idea behind the nuisance was your right to use that area is being impacted by the nuisance and you have at least some control over that area as a tenant or a landowner. So this is a, a bit of a murky area. We don't think we have the authority if someone was, say, walking or biking on the Burke where it's an open space that they don't have possessory interest in to write an NOV over that. Councilmember Schuldner. So uh, this goes back to my earlier question. So other than the warm mix idea, um, what would you say would be the next most important piece to move? Well, and I didn't actually answer your cost question. So to come back right. to that, I would say the covered load is probably the next most important thing is to make sure that we get that pinned down because that's not rebuilding the site or adding a right. lot of controls. It's putting a cover on and also means when it's moving off of the site closer to everybody, we've got more chance of it not escaping from the vehicle. And as a city manager said, we were working differently on the right. covered load. Right. Um, thank you. Thank you. Thank you Thank all. you, Mr. Kenwood. Representative Flett, thank you very much. We very appreciate much. it. And uh, don't forget uh, affordable housing. That's on the agenda. <laughs> <laughs> yes. All right, next item on the agenda is citizen comments. An opportunity for you to express your views on issues that are important to you and to the community. And we ask you please limit your comments to three minutes and there will be a timer on the screen behind me so you will be reminded. So anyway, clerk please call the first person. Anya Hellman. Hello, I am Anya Hellman. I live in Kenmore, um, and I am, as some of you know, the pastor at North Lake Lutheran Church here in Kenmore. Um, North Lake Lutheran is a member of the ELCA. It's a specific group. Uh, not all Lutheran churches are part of ELCA. And the ELCA has a process that is specifically designed for churches to engage um, in order to help those churches become more inclusive and welcoming of all people, um, especially this particular process focuses on the LGBTQIA community. So about three years ago, well, that process is called RIC, which stands for Reconciling in Christ. About three years ago, North Lake began considering becoming an RIC church. Um, and when we did this, the biggest question I heard from members of North Lake was, well, we've always been welcoming. Why do we have to say it? Why do we have to do anything about it? And our answer was, well, the church has a history and a reputation that is not welcoming. Even though we have always claimed to be welcoming, we are very aware that the church has, um, has especially with the LGBTQIA community, um, not treated that community very well. And so this has brought us to a place where people don't believe us when we say that we're welcoming. And so we have to do more. We have to be explicit. So we became an RIC church. I'm really proud that Pat, in, the, um, in October, our church overwhelmingly voted to be an RIC church. And this included a statement of inclusivity that states that because, and I quote, we are aware that lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgender persons are excluded by some congregations we welcome people of all genders and sexual orientations. Now, since we did this, I have noticed a greater awareness of LGBTQIA concerns and ways that we weren't being welcoming and we just didn't even realize it. Um, we've had a couple members who were members of the LGQ, uh, LGBTQIA, I'm not saying it right, but that community um, who have begun to be able to be more vocal and more open about who they are. And we've even had a few new members from the LGBTQIA community come and start worshiping with us. So overall, we are much more enriched by this process. So this is specific to what my church is experiencing. But unfortunately, when it comes to LGBTQIA uh, issues or concerns, governments often have the same uh, reputation. So 
I wanted to encourage the city of Kenmore to consider making a statement similar that explicitly states that we are a welcoming place, specifically of the LGBTQIA community. Um, I think we need the diversity. I have found that it has enriched North Lake Lutheran Church. I am thrilled and proud to be experiencing that right now at North Lake, and I'm hoping to experience it as a resident of Kenmore as well. Thank you. Thank you, Pastor Helman. Uh, quick question. I know I'm not supposed to do this with council's indulgence. LBGTQ, very familiar word. What's IA? IA? I, uh, IA is, one of them's quite, I know the Q is questioning. Uh, I, that's, that's not what the community has told me, but that's okay. Oh, so what's yeah, IA? Q can, Q actually can be two different things, right. queer and questioning. Um, now I'm blanking out. Karina, can you help me? Yes, yes, that's it, thank you. Intersex and asexual. Well, and that's part of, there's a lot of um, education around it. Thank you. Yeah. Um, Karina File. Hello, I'm Karina File, resident of Kenmore. And uh, tonight I'm here to ask the city of Kenmore to form or issue a proclamation uh, that the city of Kenmore supports our LGBTQ community in pride. Your support by proclamation would send the message that Kenmore is a safe, welcoming, supportive, inclusive environment where families and communities and businesses are welcome. By proclamation, that would also reduce discrimination in our community and schools. And it's been a rather contentious couple years uh, in our current administration, discrimination has gone to be a more flippant place of acceptance. And we need to do something more um, understanding and more accepting of our community. We actually have to be explicit, and we can no longer be complicit. Your support would lead to involvement and participation of our communities. To our youth, you would send the message that they are seen valued, welcome, and by your support would be uh, more accepted, and they would thrive off of that. Community support and support by government shows that youth continue to complete school in larger numbers are LGBTQ youth. Um, more go on to higher education and complete that education, and then later give back to our community by returning to work, start businesses, and even take care of our elders. So as a mother of a transgender son in our local community, he's been very out. We've had to fight for his rights for health care, uh, for his basic rights of his privacy in school systems. And in our community, it's not been necessarily the most welcoming environment. But through our family's outness, we have supported our other larger Kimor LGBTQ community that have been more out and we have a very large student population, I think you'd send a, a very wonderful message should you support our community. However, I would think after years of coming before you and asking for your support, I don't know that I could continue to live in Kenmore in the next couple years. I would probably want to move on to a city that has taken this accepted position. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Well. There's nobody else signed up. Anybody else wishing to be heard? Nobody yeah, else wishing to be heard? Thank you, Pastor. And uh, so while we uh, appreciate your comments, the next item on the agenda is the consent agenda. Is there a motion to approve? So moved. And I'll second. Um, any further discussion? Um, all those in favor of uh, the passing the consent agenda say aye. 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 Opposed? Consent agenda stands passed unanimously. Next item on the agenda is business agenda. West Amendment first update, Mr. Vincenti.
Uh, good evening, Mayor Council. <clears throat> I'll be talking about the bridge once again for you tonight. Uh, we are here, I am here, sorry, I'm used to having my consultant next to me and I forgot to invite him. <laughs> uh, so I'm here tonight to give you an update on the uh, design status of the bridge, our schedule, a, an update on the budget, and to kind of show you some of what our final architectural elements have become. Uh, I'm not asking for any council decision tonight, this is just more for information. So currently we are at 90% design. I'm actually reviewing the plans over there. Uh, we got our insurance estimate as well, so I'm going through that and with a fine tooth comb. We have gotten our SEPA comments back and our development services group is reviewing that and hopefully we'll have a decision at the end of next month. All of our other permits are in for review. We've uh, run into a few complications with some of our permitting agencies who have at the last minute decided to change our mitigation requirements. So we had to redo most of all our environmental documents, so we're a little bit late in getting approvals on that. We, uh, I think last year I mentioned that we had to get 13 permits and or approvals, where now we're at 14. We found out that we had to get permission to remove the bridge because the channel was an engineered uh, designed by the Corps, and that falls under a specific requirement, a 408, section 408. So we now have to get permission to touch the river that has been engineered. So that was a new one on all of us. So 14. I'm hoping we don't have 15. Uh, <clears throat> right away acquisition has started. We started that in January. We are negotiating with 12 parcels, one of which is also owned by the city of Kenmore, which is Rhododendron Park. I'm hoping that one goes easy. Uh, <laughs> the uh, final cost estimate, uh, we're expecting that in August 2018, so hopefully by then I'll have a much firmer idea of the cost. We still have a few design elements that we need to um, sort through. We're still working on the undergrounding design. We got a late start on that because we didn't get off, uh, uh, authorization to start that until September of last year. And so we've been working with all the utilities to move everything underground. We've got eight utilities that I have to coordinate with or agencies to get their stuff moved. So that's been a little bit cumbersome. But we've got all of their designs in and now we're going through that. And that, of course, domino effects into some certain other changes that might affect the cost. So April or August is when I'm hoping to get a final good number. If all goes well, we're planning to advertise this fall. I'm Open, cross my fingers for November, uh, and then we're looking to hopefully start construction the first quarter of 2019. I'm looking at hopefully in March 2019. Uh, prior to that, I will be having one final open house, which will talk about construction, impacts, uh, what everybody could expect, duration, just pretty much go into the whole uh, discussion for those folks that uh, uh, want to know what to expect. Uh, so the budget or the uh, estimate we got in April, uh, we right now have about $33.19 million in the budget. It's a little bit higher than what is shown because we have negotiated with North Shore Utility District to relocate their main line and they're paying for all that cost. So that is included in $33.19 million, but we haven't gotten that into the new numbers yet. So we're still negotiating with them as to what the cost will be, but they'll be responsible for paying whatever cost it takes. Um, so it's not gonna cost us anything extra. And they're also gonna pay for a proportion of our uh, um, administration costs during construction. Uh, so right now at our 90%, we're about 33.24 million, uh, a little bit higher than our budget. I'll get into that in just a second. Uh, so this is based off our 9% design. We reduced our contingency, we've got about 13% in there. That's pretty typical for this level of design. Uh, we still have some unknowns out there with the right of way acquisition. We're uh, um, working on appraisals, they're not all in. We've got a couple left to go still. I thought we'd have them in by tonight, but we don't. But uh, we also have some more permitting information that we're waiting to hear from from the other agencies because they're still reviewing our stuff, so that could affect the budget. The bidding market has been very difficult to predict. We typically went, go with a th three, four, five percent. We upped it to six percent based off of what we understood, and now we're starting to hear 10 percent. I haven't 
throwing in the 10% just yet because I'm trying to be optimistic with the 6%. Uh, and then, of course, as I mentioned before, NUT will be covering the cost of their work, so whatever that turns out to be, they'll pay for that. Uh, so again, as I mentioned, with the funding gap, we're at approximately $50,000 showing over budget. But what that doesn't take into account is some of the soft costs that uh, I'm going to be asking NUD to contribute as part of the project. And if I, with a proportion, the proportional calculation that I've done, that'll take me under the budget. So the estimate that I'm seeing that might come from NUD would be over 50000 So, so far I'm looking like we're probably okay, but we're right there on the line just to, just to let you know. So John and his team have done a really good job of keeping a really close eye on this budget and being conservative. They've got a lot of contingency built into this budget. They've got um, the inflation uh, applied as well. So I have a high level of confidence in John and his team's ability to um, predict the budget based on what information they have. However, we are in a crazy construction market right now, and we're competing with the likes of Sound Transit, um, Move Washington Forward, Seattle's bond measure, and all the other things that the private sector and other neighboring cities have going on. So, um, so demand is exceeding supply right now when it comes to uh, construction of buildings, bridges, roads, structures, and so these are really great estimates, um, but we could we could get to um, bid opening next year, early next year, and find that the low bid is pick a number two million more than we have budgeted. We just don't know. Uh, I think I think we're doing everything in our power to predict and using our, our best data and best people on it but I just we just need to be prepared in case the low bid comes in more than we have budgeted and as Rob said we we're doing everything we can to try and predict these costs we've brought in a, uh, a firm that uh, consists of retired construction companies and they have been doing a constructability review on our project and also on the estimate just to kind of see where we're at. Our construction management team, uh, KBA, they've got an individual that used to be a, uh, I believe he was a vice president or a project manager with Marsh Bank who managed or constructed uh, 522. So he's looking at the estimate and the, and the, uh, the project as well. So that we're making sure that we've accounted for everything. They, again, won't be able to predict what other contracts will bid, but we're doing everything we can to make sure that we minimize any kind of errors or gaps that we have, so. Councilmember Member Shubin. Oh, I'm sorry, you're not here. Council Member Daniewski. So the comment of um, we need to be prepared for, you know, X number um, of extra dollars, how are we preparing for that? You need to have some flexibility in your CIP and, and not uh, totally max out what we can do in our capital improvement plan. Thank you. Deputy Mayor. Well, kind of related to that, um, you know, I see in here in the report, you talk about the additive um, just bid item. Mm -hmm. Are we going to get to that later or? Uh, right there. <laughs> so this is the, this is a sidewalk and Q lane and on northbound, on the northbound side? Yeah, on the northbound east side of the street, yes. So a couple questions. One, I mean, I don't, we very well may have discussed this and I've forgotten, um, but have, has this something that's been before council before? We did mention in the past that we would be possibly putting this into the bid, but as an additive item, something that council can at the time of award decide to accept or reject and that would not affect the base project itself, which was the original uh, CIP project. Okay, because it just, it seems like, you know, we're pushing up against, this project's already gone up mm -hmm. probably 50% since we started talking about it. Um, and now we're talking about adding our $2 million on for something that's not directly related to the project at hand, which is the bridge. Um, you know, I feel like we're talking about, um, 
purchasing a car and you know we have a wish list that includes mm -hmm. everything when really what we need is just something that'll haul stuff from here to there um, so I feel like we might be getting it I mean I understand that we can take this off but I feel like we're getting like we might be just getting ahead of ourselves talking about something when we're already I know fifty thousand dollars in the grand scheme of this is small but we're already over budget mm -hmm. uh, I fully expect that we will be further over budget because just the way that this has been going for the last three years um, I haven't seen anything I haven't seen this I haven't seen the cost slow down the last three years um, and so adding another two million dollars on there just I, I I question that um, at this point but that's just me and that's why we're only talking about the estimated project costs on the base the 33.24 million we aren't really talking about the additive because one we are showing the additive to be over our available budget but mm -hmm. two it is something that wasn't part of the original scope but much like your car additive this is like getting the tinted windows you can tell the salesman nope don't want it I just want the base so give me that so that's, right and I guess the bid yeah. could come in lower they could come in lower the and nice thing about that. doing this is that we have a design it will be independent from the base bid so that if we decide not to do this it can be on the shelf we can apply for grants for it we have it it's all ready to go makes it far more competitive for any kind of future grants as the design would be done and the only thing we would have to do to build it would be just update some of the documentation to match current standards but that's that's the benefit of taking it through to the very end so that we have something okay so that, that that makes more sense thanks I, yeah, I, yeah, I, I guess I, I'm looking at it as the fact that we are building this bridge. This, build, this bridge is, is 70 some years old. Um, this next bridge we're going to build is certainly going to last us at least 50. And we know that we're planning on some growth. We know that we're planning to expand the lane width, the three lanes from the bridge to 522. Um, so I guess. It doesn't make sense to me to build this bridge without the capability of the expansion to that third lane. I mean, this is a huge cost, and that the, the, the two million extra is not insignificant, but I think it's minor in the grand scope of things. That we're only going to get one shot at building this in the next 50 years, and if we're going to do it, we should be doing it right and using the money for the best for the community in the long run. That's just my thoughts. Councilmember Smith. Just so I understand this correctly, this is to add a third lane on, e on the east side of 68th on the north side of the bridge, right? It's essentially extending the existing Q lane. Right now it goes, right. we'll say 50 feet south of 175th. This will just extend it to the bridge itself. And on top of that, it will provide a larger sidewalk and it will also provide an additional amenity strip for the buffer for pedestrians walking on that side. So it provides a little additional queue space as you get further north, but it really doesn't affect the bridge project in any way if it weren't included. Correct. It would not affect the bridge, the bridge project itself. Uh, yeah. Any All right. other questions, comments? Thank you. So the, the, the graph in front of you right now pretty much il it illustrates the funding that we have today, which is a 12 million BRAC, the 8 million in connecting Washington funds, the little over 1 million in STP funds, the 6.9 million in DIB funds. There I'm showing the 1.46 million in NUD funds and then the 3.77 million that we earmarked for this project. The uh, other two columns, the first one of course, the second one is the estimated project cost without the sidewalk on the north east side and then the second one is the cost with it so that just gives you a general perspective of how things are costing and where they're coming out if you'll notice uh, the engineers estimate for the I'll just talk about the, the base one right now the engineers estimate is 19.18 million we've got about 13 percent or 2.55 million incorporated into the estimate and then we also on top of that have 10% contingency during construction. So we're, we're accounting for our normal construction contingency plus a design contingency on top of the current estimate. So on the, with the budget strategy, as I stated before, we are on the fringe. We're looking at about $50,000 over budget, not making any recommendations at this time to address this issue. We have, uh, 
uh, plenty of time to kind of look at what we're dealing with. We've got the August number coming in. When I spoke to you back in, I believe it was September, about our options for reducing cost, a lot of those options can easily be popped out, plopped out of the design and won't cost us really that much more money. So we do have cost saving measures that we could still employ if we felt that the cost going into bid would be too high for our comfort level. And can you give a couple of examples of those? An example would be the signal at 170th. We did keep that into the project, and that estimate would could reduce the cost by, I believe we're looking at about $350,000 if we decided not to replace that. Other options would have been to not use the decorative hand railing along the bridge itself. That saves us several thousand dollars. Not using the decorative lighting saves us about $100,000. Uh, uh, the northbound bridge treatments to that. that. Those are the northbound bridge treatments, yeah. Yep. Or, or the northbound bridge treatments would be, oh boy, I have gone off my memory on this one. That's okay. Yeah, I think we're probably no more than about sixty, seventy thousand dollars $70,000 for that railing. So, but yeah, there's, there, there are still things that we can take out. There, there's, we are kind of past the point of any high value savings. A lot of those uh, should have occurred way back in 60%, like, like um, reducing the width of the bridge. We really can't do much <laughs> more with that. So, but yeah, that's, that's kind of where we're at. Uh, we did look, I did look at our other grant opportunities, but um, the BRAC funding we have, we got the maximum award allowable per project, so we can't go back to them. TIB actually has given us one of the highest awards they've ever given for uh, this funding, and they won't give us any more after that. Connecting Washington, we do have funding for 522B. We could make a request to them to transfer some of that funding to the bridge, but there's no guarantees. That funding is earmarked for 2019, 2020, 21, 22, and 23, 24 bienniums. So there could be a delay to the project if we were to get some of those connecting Washington dollars moved. Again, it's, uh, it's an opportunity that we could take if we wanted to explore it, but it could take time. For the uh, 522 West, that one is, I believe, 12 million. Yeah. Uh, with the uh, Puget Sound Regional Council, we currently have $400,000 awarded to construction. They also only award one project, one award per phase per project. If we were to request additional money from them, we would have to first give back the $400,000. No guarantee that we'll get any money from them. And their next funding isn't available until 2022. And so I have to have that funding available before I can obligate the funds and advertise. So we have a significant delay in time if we went after PSRC. After that, the only option would be to uh, talk to our legislators about giving us more money talking to the federal government, that's about all we have left out there. Last eight seconds and we'll give you three minutes. All right. Any more questions? Yeah, can you say this? One's actually a comment. I think the, uh, the whole team has done an incredible job of getting grants to fund most of this bridge. And uh, I know it's been a long process and a lot of work but uh, I appreciate that. Thank, Thank you. you. Deputy Mayor. Yeah, I want to um, kind of um, what Councilmember Curtis said. What, what I was saying earlier about the, uh, I, I hope that you didn't take what I said earlier about the costs going up as an attack on you. I certainly didn't mean that. I recognize that these projects are incredibly difficult. I mean, I remember when I was um, still coming here as a citizen and Councilmember Smith squeezed in $50,000 for the first bridge funds back in, what was that, 2012 or something. <laughs> Um, so I've seen this thing from beginning, and it's, it's um, I can't wait for us to actually cut the ribbon on this thing and be done with it, because I'm kind of tired of talking about it. But thank you for all your work, John. <laughs> Councilor Smith. Hey, um, John, thanks. I would echo the, my prior two colleagues on their comments. And I wanted to ask you, on the, on going back to the 522B project, so knowing that that could create a delay, what would be the what thresholds have to be met where we would then consider trying to make that request? And, and I guess what I mean by that is, is there any reason we can't 
consider maybe going down that path and be really prepared for that process? So if we were to go down that path, there, there's always the possibility that they could say, yes, we will move the money and we can make it available to match your schedule. They had moved money around for us originally with the bridge. The bridge money really wasn't available until 20, 2020, 2019, 20, 2020 cycle, and they moved it up ahead and they move 522B further ahead. So there is the possibility that somebody else out there is not spending their money and they're willing to, to move things around. If that were to happen, then we wouldn't miss our window. If they were to tell us that no, you're gonna, if you want that money, you're gonna have to um, use it when it's available for 522B. I mean, we have, without having the engineering crystal ball, the uh, cost, the threshold, I mean, it could be two million, three million, four million. It could be, it could cost less in 2022 if the economy doesn't um, keep taking off the way it is. It's just, it's too hard to predict. So in terms of threshold, we just have to make our best guess and uh, go for it. Okay. Yeah. If I can help answer that too. Yeah, so let's say bids come in and it's several million more. That might be a, an opportunity for you as council to hit the pause button and uh, then take that idea to the state legislature. It's gonna be a full regular session at the state legislature so we wouldn't know the answer maybe until June and then the money wouldn't be, able to be available until July of next year. So it would really be a 2020 construction date. Oops, <laughs> sorry about that. <laughs> Thank you. Councilmember Curtis. So with that connect Washington funds, if we know it's coming, um, could we get a loan or borrow or do something just to bridge a couple of years? I mean, I, I hate the idea of delaying this bridge. I, I would like to see it moving forward rather than. So as I understand it from the last conversation I had with the state, you cannot incur any expenses on your project until the funding is available. So that's kind of one of the reasons we've got things maneuvered the way we do for this project and also for 522B. We have to wait until it's all available before they will allow us to utilize those funds. Given that it's an 18 month project, we could give ourselves a bridge loan um, <laughs> and uh, get underway and then, and then um, have the money re reimbursed for uh, expenses that come after legislature approval, but that's worst case we could do a council night of two million right now today to finish the bridge and you could possible up and mm -hmm. just pay that two million off. And yep. Yeah, I'd, ha I'd hate to see that delay in any of that sort of thing. Yeah. All right. Any further questions? Thank you, sir. All right. Appreciate it. I'm, uh, not, I'm right. not done yet. Oh, you're not done yet. Okay, no, I fine. figured I figured I'd get the boring stuff over with first, and then do the fun stuff second. So, architectural stuff. So, I've been talking with council for, gosh, I three years now about what this bridge might, what, what we might want this bridge to look like. So, it's taken us three years to finally make some decisions, because there are just way too many choices out there for us to look at. So. I wanna show you just a few things that we've kinda of settled upon and just kinda of get your feedback on that and uh, what you think. So street lighting, this is the pole that we've selected along with the um, fixture. So we're gonna have some poles that are gonna be single pole and some that are gonna be dual pole. So that's generally what the pole is gonna look like going down the corridor. It's a double, pole type system where you've got one pole welded to another pole and uh, they call it the stylo SR. This pole has a couple of interesting features. Uh, so this is the fixture. It looks kind of like an oar. That was not intentional. But it is, uh, um, it's an LED fixture so just giving you an idea of kind of what that looks like. Uh, a couple of things is there's a light that comes down off of the side which illuminates just below it so it'll illuminate parts of the street, the landscaping, that sort of thing. And then there is a light on the top. 
that just kind of glows, so you see that as you go down the corridor. We have been looking at how to make the lighting interesting, so we're looking at adding RGB capabilities. So this will have, I believe she said we can program nine or ten different colors. Any color pattern we want, it's just we program it, set it, and go. So you can think of any season, any reason you want to color, we can light her up. So those are what the poles are going to do. Uh, I'm not sure how well you can see that. The, in the center is the color, pull color we've been going for. It's the dark blue. To give you some reference, black, I'm showing a color black there. That's uh, just to give you an idea of the blue because it was kind of hard to tell what the blue looked like by itself. And then on the lower corner is our standard color for uh, what we have on 522 throughout the city. That's what we're going to use for the signals. So we're going to stick with the standard color and then the lights from the 170th, 175th is going to be that blue color. Uh, so pedestrian lighting, we've got a barrier between the pedestrian bicycle area and the roadway. We're going to have lighting that's going to be shooting down from the barrier onto the pathway. That light is also going to be RGB, so we can have the colors change as we need to on that one. The lookout, we're going to have a light that shines down from the lower bench and also a light that shoots up from the back. Those were just going to be standard white lights. Uh, so this is kind of what the barrier is going to look like. We got a little wavy pattern there. That's what the lighting is going to kind of look like as you go down the pathway, and that'll be just the width of the bridge. Once we get past the bridge, it'll be just your standard street lights. The outlook area is going to, you've seen this image before. We fine-tune a little bit. You'll see the, uh, uh, or the signs around the railing, which are interpretive signs. We've got the bench with the different types of oars up against the back there. That's what we're anticipating it's going to look like at night. So the, the lighting kind of illuminates the flooring, but illuminates up the oars. So that's something you would see down on the river, over at Lake Point, over in the boat launch, that sort of thing. And these are the different styles of the oars that our consultant put together. The oars represent different types of boating. I'm not an expert, so I'm not really sure which oars which. But you'll see a bunch of words on the oars. Those are going to identify what type of boating activity the oars are used for. So a little bit of education for folks that are uh, coming there to sit. Or, uh, um, uh, so the interpretive signs, we're going to be putting... John, sorry. John, I've got yeah. one quick question. Yeah. What, are, what are the oars going to be made of? What was that? Again? What are the oars going to be made of? Uh, so the oars are going to be made of metal, I believe. They haven't just told me what type. They're going to be powder coated, and they're going to, we haven't kind of narrowed down what the actual coloring is going to be. I think the goal was to make them look like oars, but not be a variety of different colors. Just okay. something very standard so that it doesn't take away from the rest of the show, if you will. Thanks. Uh, so the interpretive signs, we're looking at placing four on the corridor. These interpretive signs are going to be blank slates so that we can add whatever we want to them at a later date. So we can put historical information on them. We can make the art. People can put them on there. Educational. We can do bulletins, whatever we might want. We're going to set them up so that there are little pins that you unscrew and stick the, the uh, plaque on there. How uh, resistant will the uh, fixtures themselves be uh, to vandalism? So they're going to be just as resistant to anything else. I mean, if you take a bat to it and beat it, it'll break. But it's not. It's going to be made out of metal. They're not going to be something that you can very easily. I'm thinking more of the plastic cover or whatever cover you're going to use over, you know, somebody just taking a key or taking some sharp instrument and cutting it up. So right now the plan would be the plaques would be made out of metal and they would be etched. If it's art, they would be painted. So there wouldn't be, we're not necessarily looking at something being encased in a little plastic case and putting in a flyer inside there. This would be more something a bit more sturdy. Okay. Yeah, I mean, if, if we want to do something less expensive like plastic, we could do that. But again, yeah, people could scratch it or damage it if they wanted to. But again, these are also designed to be popped off and popped back on if we need to. So this is uh, an idea of what we are looking to have these signs look like. Uh, they're about one and a half wide by about two feet long. And we'll have uh, one or two at the observer in the um, the overlook area, and then a couple along the 
the bridge itself. The idea was to, as people are walking by, to have some experience as they're going through and not just go through. So this is kind of the style that we're looking at. Uh, I think that was it that I have for now. Question on Marshall. And what sort of pub public uh, participation process have we gone through for the art, or might we go through? So in terms of the art, there has been no public process on that. This is something that we f that figured could happen at any time. For this particular project, we're not putting any art in there. Like, again, there are pretty much blank slates. If council wants us to p have something made available when construction's done, we could start that process at any time. And I'm, I mean the oars specifically and the design. Are we going to let the public know what these designs look like? So we've been to the public. We went had a public house uh, initially, which showed this entire layout, which showed the oars, showed the overlook, showed uh, uh, some coloring options, whatnot. And uh, uh, the majority of the comments were they loved it. There was no, the only thing that they talked about was traffic. So. <laughs> and um, yeah, you've had a couple open houses on this. Uh, when was the last one? So I had my open houses. I'm going to guess here that I had them in 2016. It has been a while. So I've had, two, I've had two. One was for the general public. We invited uh, the entire city. The second one was strictly for river users. So we invited everybody that lived or had access to the river from the mouth all the way through to the Sammamish River, or Lake Sammamish. And then we also included the Coast Guard who mailed out to everybody on their list. So, so we've shared this with those two groups. And then, of course, I've sent notices out to the public on this one, and I'll be sending another one, not sure when, June, July, something like that, yeah. Tom Smith. I would request that on your oars and the paddles that you showed that you use this, whatever, the thickest gauge steel you could <laughs> possibly use, because you know people will be hanging on them, they'll be tying stuff to them, and who knows what else, and, and I would hate to see us create such a cool, artistic piece and have it destroyed easily. Yeah, I agree. All right. That's it? All righty. I think we're, we've got everything in hand here. Cool. Thank you. All right. Um, staff report. Yeah, just two things. Uh, this week, Sound Transit is hosting a couple of community meetings regarding uh, the bus rapid transit project that's going to be going through the 522 corridor. One is tomorrow night from 6 to 8 p.m. at the North Shore Senior Center um, in uh, Bothell. And the other one, also 6 to 8 p.m., is on Thursday at Brookside Elementary in Lake Forest Park. Um, I'll be attending the one tomorrow night. And, Mayor, I believe you're going to be attending the one on Thursday night. Is that correct? Correct. Thank you. Also, Arts of Kenmore is... Um, hosting another art gallery here at City Hall this Friday, June 1st, 6.30 to 8 p.m. All right. Um, comments, reports? Um, Council Member Bluniski. Nothing to add. Council Member Shrebnik. Nothing to add. Council Member Curtis. Nothing to add. Council Member Marshall. Nothing at this moment. Councilmember Smith. Nothing to add. Thank you. Deputy Mayor. As I mentioned two weeks ago, um, I was um, wanting to have discussions with councils as to how we could recognize Pride Month, which is starting on Friday. Um, I appreciate uh, Pastor Hellman and uh, Ms. Vile for coming in and speaking a bit. You know, as a city, we've recognized um, a lot of things. Uh, we recognize kids to park. Parks Day, we recognize uh, Child Abuse Prevention Month, Pancreatic Cancer Month, um, Ostrom's Drug and Gift Week, um, just a long list of things that we recognize as, as a city. Um, and I think it's past time that we take the time and just do a quick, uh, a quick resolution just showing, just naming uh, maybe the last week in June when um, the uh, Pride Parade is, is going to be going on in Seattle um, as, as Pride Week in, in the city of Kenmore. And... Um, really show everybody that we accept um, the folks who live in our community. It feels weird being a straight guy coming out with, you know, 
bringing this forward, but there's not a better option up here. So I just want to toss that out there. I think it's an important thing. I think it's past time. And I would move that we recognize the last week of, uh, of June as uh, Pride Week in the city of Kenmore. Do you want to move it as Pride Week? I mean, we could go a month. I was just. Yeah. No, because Greta and L, C, D, C, Q, I. Well, we could, it would have. There's an S and there's another. We, we would need to, I, I would. Pride part week. of the reason why I was looking at Pride Week is because it's uh, good to give us a couple weeks to get something written up and to wordsmith and make sure that we're good with it. So. Um, Second. I don't know if that was a motion, but okay. Um, it was a motion. Did you make the mo did you make a motion? No. No. Okay. So moved and seconded. Uh, any comments? To, can I clarify with the deputy sure. mayor? So this is the last week in June was part of your motion, correct? Uh, yes. Okay. Thank you. Any questions? Any comments? Councilmember Marshall. I think the motion is very well placed. Um, having grown up in Canmore and having seen the amazing and historical changes in our very society and that we've arrived at a new day in Canmore and a better day in Canmore as measured at least by the United States Supreme Court in the Obergefell decision from about three years ago. I think it was recognizing the rights of people to marry uh, regardless of gender and all kinds of other uh, organizations and cities and employers recognizing the contributions of gay, lesbian, bisexual, transsexual people, questioning people in the military in our businesses, in our governments, at each and every level. I, it's, I would be very proud to uh, support this pride uh, proclamation in Kenmore as council member, uh, as deputy mayor says, it's uh, long overdue and it would be a great thing. Just last, um, last week, my son Quinn attending Kenmore Middle School uh, reported, and I was unaware of this, that uh, the school had sponsored uh, kids and, and a supportive effort for Pride as well. So the kids were going to Kenmore Middle School in rainbow colors, something I never would have dreamed of growing up here. And I am so proud to, sit, to see that we have come this far and done so well in this great nation, in this city. Any other comments? All right, the motion before us then is to declare the last week in June as Pride Week. Um, and all those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed? The uh, motion passes unanimously. Okay, abstentions. One abstention. May I comment Certainly. on my abstention? Certainly. So over, my, uh, over the years as a physician, there were many situations where my personal beliefs and those of my patients differed. And I had no problem with that. I still gave good care to all of my patients um, despite those differences. And sometimes my patients and I did discuss those, those differences of opinion. And this is one that on the one hand, I am a council member who supports every person in Kenmore. On the other hand, I have some personal beliefs that differ. And so that's why I'm abstaining. All right. Um, left off Deputy Mayor Katie. Um, so I have been asked to be part of a panel on the King County Ferry System. Uh, Val Constantine has put this together. He feels that uh, it's time in order to give another option for a car to reinstitute the ferry system. And since we're pretty much at the top of the list and we've been after this for a long time, it seems senseless to me to quit now. Um, so uh, I, I've been asked to be part of this, uh, the panel. Uh, it's gonna happen on June 8th. Um, so I, I sent you guys all an email with an invitation, free lunch, and if you guys can get there and, and uh, be part of this group, and uh, it would be appreciated. Um, and Tomorrow night, don't forget, 
Washington at Inglewood uh, Country Club is uh, the Attorney General speaking at the uh, Sound Cities Association dinner. 5.30 for happy hour and I believe 6.30 the program starts. So, um, and I'm part of the program so I should really know that. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm pretty sure it's 6.30 but if you walk in and it already started, you know it started at 6. So anyway, um, if there's no further business to come before us, Oh, yeah, no, I did it. We're adjourned. <laughs>